And as Eric just pointed out, we own, mm-hmm. we've only had electricity though here in the state for about 30 years. Uh. <laughs> I, mean, I think he's got you guys in the Amish mixed up. It's true. It's true. We have Mennonites out here. We have, really? lot, yeah. we have a lot of Mennonites in Kansas. They do uh, some great woodwork and great butter. We have, uh, uh, I think they're Mennonites here too, uh, up in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. I've only ever had the honey before, hmm. but they, they do a good that's job. That's from with bees. The Not The Mennonites don't make that. Oh, they don't? No, that's the bees oh, make that. They just yeah. handle the bees. Yeah, that's right. And jar it. Got it. Okay. It's important gotcha. to make sure people yeah, know that would be weird <laughs> this isn't honey honey that's right i made this myself did you yeah and so no fail is just kind of bringing it back to like hey man what were you taught when you learned how to ride a bike having a flyer go on somewhere else is almost as serious I think because I mean the original weapon lights that were issued were like what 60 lumens or something like that. Yeah. Hey everyone, Matt Lanfer here with primary and secondary. Welcome to Modcast. Today is March 21st, 2021. The episode today is 263 ballistics, shot placement, and headshots. I'm thinking this is going to be a good dis- discussion. I say that every time, but I mean it. Um, every time we have one of these, every time we have one of these podcasts, good info is coming out. Um, good discussions. I learned something. I hope the panelists learn something and I suspect the listeners learn as well. Uh, big thanks to our sponsors. Uh, big thanks to Filster Holsters. If you're looking for an ambidextrous near universal, preferably appendix holster, preferably because that's pretty much the way I've been using it. You are looking for the floodlight. Basically, let's see here. Do I even have one next to me? Dang it, I don't. I have a pro right there. Oh, no, here it is. Here, floodlight. Um, Basically, if you have a bunch of guns and a bunch of weapon lights, it's nice to be able to just use one specific holster for all of them. Additionally, um, it's very, it's not only well-made, it's uh, modular as well. But uh, yeah, a lot of thought went into this. And it's funny how many people have gone from using the Kydex cod pieces where the one piece holster mag pouch all in one to going back to something like this, the floodlight and a separate mag pouch. It's happening. Um, Also, big thank you to Staccato. So I have this XC right here. So I shot it for the first time. Shot this XC for the first time just a couple days ago. I've shot these before. After shooting it, I knew I wanted to get one. So basically, it was a buddy of mine and I, and and we kind of were shooting it a lot. We wound up going to about 40, 45 yards, low light, clearing the plate rack, uh, one-handed because we were using handheld lights comparing it to uh, using a weapon light and seeing how feasible it is. And sure. Yeah. The pistol's awesome. And the red dot, I'm just telling you, if you haven't figured this out already, red dots are absolutely cheating. So if you're not already on the red dot train, it's time. Now, that being said, floodlight and random 2011 fits. Amazing. Awesome pistols. If you're looking to get a 2011, um, so far, I've been nothing but impressed with these staccatos. Uh, they are formerly known as STI. I have the C2 right here. Shot this a bunch also. Great, great shooting pistols. Now, if you don't want to go into the 2011 game, might be a little too pricey. The, the, the upkeep and maintenance might be a little bit too much for your taste. We do have the Walther PDP series, and this is the full size. I've been carrying this off duty. This is an awesome shooting gun. Now, the differences, so I just talked about the staccato. Staccatos are awesome shooting. These are awesome shooting. I'm a fan of guns. I'm a fan of guns that work right. I'm a fan of guns that provide me with good ergonomics. And this is loaded, so I'm not going to be messing with it too much. 
because I'm carrying it. Um, a good er ergonomics. It's giving me pinky support. It's giving me great capacity. Um, it's also red dot, red dot ready. Good stuff. Um, basically, this line, if you haven't already gotten a red dots, if you're looking to maybe change from, you've always been a Glock or CZ person, check out these PDPs. Um, there's also a, a, a compact version, which is roughly the size of a Glock 19. However, it still provides me with pinky support at uh, about 15 round capacity and nine mil, but great, great guns. So lastly, big thank you to our Patreon subscribers. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to do all these cool things. Right now we are working on a big, a big training thing. We did it last year. It's gonna be even better this year. Um, getting new instructors in along with the instructors we had last year. And right now I'm working on a deal where we're going to be able to have ammo available at non, or let's say, let's call them pre-COVID and pre-rapey pricing or non-rapey pricing. So think of how it was to buy ammo back before COVID, before all these shortages. I believe that's what I'm going to be able to provide for the students. Now, this is only going to be ammunition for the class. I can't be giving people thousands and cases and this and that. I'm only going to be able to get pretty much allocate a thousand of nine per student and 500 to a thousand of five, five, six. So uh, right now it is open. The tuition is uh, uh, registration is open to only a couple levels of Patreon, uh, the Patreon subscribers. It's going to be opened up to all the Patreon subscribers, at least network support and up. Um, and then from there, you're, you'll have access to be able to purchase ammo ahead of time. The, the thought behind this is, well, number one, I want to be able to provide ammo so people can train or provide access. I can't provide the ammo, but I can provide access to ammo. I don't want people to have to use their secret stash because this stuff is expensive. Also, people that are traveling over here, it really sucks to have to fly and to have stuff with you because you can't bring that much or have it shipped ahead of time. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at of, uh, removing all of that complication and having ammunition on site available to purchase. And again, it's going to be allotted per student X amount of rounds. Uh, I think one of the things I, I might wind up doing is having a, a, a rifle registration and a pistol only registration, or actually a normal registration and a pistol only registration. And what that means is with the, with the rifle ammo or the, the pistol only, you'll only get nine mil with regular tuition. You'll have a combination of nine mil and some five, five, six. I'm excited about that. Can't talk about who the provider is at this point. Things are really, really hopeful and, and really positive. So uh, go to primaryandsecondary.com slash uh, forum to go check out progress on that kind of stuff. Primaryandsecondary.com overall on the left-hand side on the menu near the bottom has uh, the, the, most of the details from last year because they carry over into this, this year. The event is September 4th, 5th, 6th on the forum though. Um, ask me any questions. I'd rather have it on the forum than Facebook because Facebook's not everyone's on Facebook. Not everyone wants to be on Facebook. Go to our forum. Um, let's see here. Also, patreon.com slash primary and secondary. If you want to keep up with my latest announcements, if you want to support the network. Also, I have discounts for the whole event. Um, I suspect we're probably going to run out of uh, space. I suspect we're going to we're going to sell out on this, especially because we're going to be able to offer ammo. And that's that's unique. And I'm, I'm very appreciative to the, the, the companies that are that are helping with this. So with that in mind, I think it is time to start the show. So since we're, we are officially rolling and we got actually people watching, I think we need to hear from you. you said you go by Bud at uh, Starbucks. That's we correct. Go, <laughs> we need to go. We need to hear from the good doctor about his background, how he got into the field he's in, why he got into it. All that good stuff. And I understand also you have, you have some, uh, uh, some background also with a very popular instructor as you were the head of was it medical training stuff. Yeah. I was the medical program director for, yeah. uh, for tactical response and everybody's yeah. professional wrestling heel, James Yeager. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, he's kind of a polarizing guy. I mean, not kind of, he is. Oh, he is. Um, no. Yeah. And people either love him or they hate him. Uh, you know, like James has always been good to me, so I don't have any beef with him. Uh, genius businessman. 
Yeah, I, I left there not because of like any ill will. I think um, I, I think I'm actually like maybe one of the only former tactical in response instructors that's still um, like part of the. Uh, you still get a Christmas card. Yeah, I'm still. I wasn't voted off the island. Yep. Um, and um, and so yeah, I mean, I still train out there a couple times a year. Um, you know, I see James on a fairly regular basis. We just had lunch the other day. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I started doing that in 2006 when, um, I moved to Tennessee, when I got here, I actually moved here from Washington state. And when I got here, I was like, you know, I need to find some place to train. Um, when I was in Washington, I trained, um, with some of Marty Hayes's affiliates at the firearms Academy of Seattle. And, um, and then, um, uh, when I got here, I was like, well, you know, I need to find something else. And, you know, Camden, uh, was about an hour and 10 minutes from where I was living. And so I started training there and wasn't there for very long before James was like, you know, he found out that before I was going to the medical college here that I, you know, worked as a first responder for 10 years and had an EMS background and, um, and said, Hey, you know, what do you know about this stuff? And I said, well, you know, I know a little bit and, and, um, and then after a while he was like, uh, well, why don't you, you know, you know, you can teach the medical stuff primarily, but also, you know, be cross trained as a, as a firearms instructor. And I had had probably, um, I don't know, probably around 2000 hours of formal training at that point nice. before. And, um, and then, um, did his instructor course and then kind of did like the apprenticeship thing for about a year. Cool. Um, where it was probably 40 weekends and then, um, and then, you know, started teaching, um, firearms classes for him independently as well. Nice. Uh, and then when I left there, I never, I never went and taught firearms classes, um, um, you know, under my own banner other than like promotional stuff, you know, that I did with Chuck, um, or with the other guys at Polypalooza and things like that. Um, yeah. just kind of one-offs, nothing, nothing um uh specifically you know firearm centric although kind of like firearms tangential because i do a lot of i don't know what you call them collaboration or team up classes with other people where they do the um, firearm side and i do the medicine side and then we kind of you know do um combination field exercise type stuff cool uh, but that's sort of a brief snapshot but you know the full snapshot is is um, I became a, a police explorer cadet when I was 16 um, and then uh, went to community college when I graduated um, to the law enforcement program there, which was basically, you know, just a stretched out version of the academy that you got college credit for. Yeah. And, and um, after I completed that, uh, I went to um, I actually started working full time in the fire service then for a combination department that was fire and EMS. Um, and then I also worked, uh, as a guard on an armored truck mm -hmm. company. Um, and then, you know, at that point I was working like, uh, five days a week and that wasn't enough. So then I picked up, uh, another day a week working for just the hospital based EMS service, uh, which was ALS, um, provider, uh, where I was at and did that for several years. And then um, ended up go moving to Spokane, Washington, where I went to Gonzaga University for three years and picked up two more degrees. And then moved to Nashville, Tennessee. And I've been here uh, in Nashville for 16 years now. So, so and then currently, yeah. as oh, uh, I work as a, a uh, assistant professor of oral and maxillofacial surgery um, for a medical college here. Um, and that takes up uh, probably about 90% of my time. I still work as a, a reserve police officer. Um, and then I still, um, teach on, you know, the occasional, well, I probably teach probably 10 classes a year. So about mm -hmm. you know, one every month and, or six weeks or so. Cool. And, um, and I just do, you know, open enrollment, um, mostly for, uh, for the um 
attendees of, you know, how like a lot of uh, training companies have like regular attendees. So it's like the people yeah. that show up, you know, that ta have taken every shooting class. Now they host me and they show up for the medical class kind of thing. Cool. So, um, and then church groups and things like that as well. Yeah. So yeah. We, we have, you know, huge churches out here in Tennessee, you know, with, with a, a 10,000 parishioners and one church. And um, so there's always kind of a, and we've actually had a couple, unfortunately, you know, active shooter events at churches here in Nashville. So um, there's a definite uh, um, market for it, you know. Absolutely. So, so they get the most agnostic guy that they can find to come in and try and give everybody a straight shot at it, I suppose. Well, that's definitely been a hot topic on, on Facebook, people asking about church security groups and training and things like that. So it's absolutely yeah. pertinent and important. Um, tell me a bit about your specialty um, on the medical so side. A, okay. I'm a hospital dentist and a hospital dentist is um, people don't usually hear that term until I say like, well, you've heard of uh, Gary K Roberts before. And they're like, yeah, of course, doc GKR, you know? And I'm like, yeah, he's also a hospital dentist. And then they're like, Oh, oh, okay. And I said, yeah, we do the exact same kind of thing. So um, basically what it boils down to is that we're uh, an attached portion or, or I can't speak exactly for him because I don't know what the parameters of his educational facility are. But as far as mine goes, I'm like the uh, direct action version of the oral and maxillofacial surgery department. So um, my job is to... Um, we're attached to a hospital. So the college and the hospital are literally like right next door to each other, connected by just a corridor and, um, patients that come into the ER that have any, uh, you know, wounds basically from the floor of the orbit, um, all the way down to, uh, underneath the jaw falls into our real estate category. And, um, we're in the inner city and we service a large population of Nashville where there's on average about uh, three to five shootings per day. Yeah. And so, um, and those people are largely um, as screwed up as this sounds, they're largely uninsured. So they end up coming to our hospital and um, we take care of them. And so the funny thing about that, of course, is that um, a number of those people, if they make it to the emergency room, they make it to the ICU and if they make it to the ICU, then they generally make it, you know, back out alive. Um, and that's not because, well, it's for two reasons. Number one is we're awesome and we're good that's at right. our job. Um, but number two is that, uh, you know, handgun rounds in particular or, um, low caliber rifle rounds or sorry, low velocity rifle rounds are just horrible at, um, at, you know, causing, um, immediately life ending injuries. So, uh, we see a number of my put pictures of them on my Instagram page, um, you know, and, and put a little, uh, you know, brief synopsis kind of in, in lay person language there so that people can get what we're, we're doing. And, you know, it's uh, very few of, uh, very little of it has to do with the teeth. You know, people think that like, I'm not, the, I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not the guy to go to if you need to know, like, um, what's best for bleaching your teeth and, and things like that. I don't really, I don't really get too much into that. Maybe my dental assistants could help you with that, but it's not something I really pay too much attention to. Um, so this tooth and it's aching. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I can take that out. Yeah. We can yeah, take that out. Right. right get straight a away. hammer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what I do. The majority of the time, um, you know, we deal with whatever comes through the door. We also spend two days a week taking care of, correctional care patients from all over the mm. state of Tennessee, um, that are brought to us by corrections officers. And you'd be amazed at what we see with them. Anything from penetrating trauma to um, blunt force trauma, to cancer, to abscesses, to rotten teeth, the whole gamut. And um, it's uh, it makes for an interesting week. I, I, I really love my job and I'm happy to go to work every day. And after working in private practice for about 12 years, um, well, I say private practice, but it's not what you would think is private practice. It's public health, private practice, which is 
um, I, I really could just call it public health. It's just m mostly taking care of people that are so sick that they uh, are going to die if they don't get abscesses taken out of their skulls um, or uh, people that can't afford to have massive amounts of, of restorative dental work. So they end up with, um, you know, meth mouth type issues or, yeah. you know, just generalized decay. Even the ones that don't aren't into narcotics, they get, you know, pretty sick. So um, that's what I do. And um, it's a, uh, it's a fun place to be. I originally had thought about being uh, an emergency room physician. And, um, you know, because I had such extensive experience in pre-hospital care um, and, you know, working directly with the emergency department on the ambulance. And one night I was at work and, um, and, you know, in between calls, you'd go into the, uh, their employee lounge, you know, and get one of those short yeah. cans of soda and some, yeah. and some saltines. And um, one of the ER physicians was there and he was like, Hey, how's it going? How's your studies going? I said, Oh, they're going really good. Like I'm going to take the MCAT soon. And he said, uh, MCAT, huh? Okay. You really want to do this? And he said, you're, you know, you're going to not be retiring for, you know, like 45 years. And I said, yeah, yeah, I know. That's, that's kind of what I want to do. And he said, okay, well, you know, if I was going to do this all over again, I think I'd be a dentist. And I said, really? And he goes, yeah, you do all the same stuff, except you don't have a horrible call schedule. And I said, really? Like, I had no idea. And he's like, yeah. I mean, what did you think they did? And I said, I don't know. I thought they did like fillings and sealants and stuff. And he said, well, that's just the stuff that you've had done. He said, there's a whole other, you know, world out there that you don't know anything about. And I was like, huh? Okay. Well, as it turned out, my mom worked for a dentist from the time I was like three years old. So I orchestrated it with her to go work with, you know, some oral surgeons and some other people and, and then her boss as well. And then immediately I just kind of like shifted gears and, but I found myself, you know, in uh, the facet of the profession where I do still have the same call schedule. So it's it's kind of like six and one half and a dozen of the other, but it's good either way. So how often does a case come into the hospital where it adjusts your teaching schedule where, oh, this you, you, we all need to come to see this and discuss this and see and then see it in person? Um. Well, the lectures are only ever a maximum of two hours. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times if I come out of a lecture, there might be someone like waiting to ferry me to wherever they are, or they'll call and, or text, you know, and I'll check my text messages at the end and then they'll say, need you here mm -hmm. or need you over here. And I'll, I'll go there. That happens fairly regularly. Well, oh, I mean, um, for the students benefit. Oh, oh, like where it turns into like a teaching case kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, daily. It happens daily. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I always tell people that, you know, um, people kind of have a strange idea of, of what, you know, medical school or professional school and dental school is like. And it's to me, my perspective is it's a lot like the movie young Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that movie with Gene Wilder? Frankenstein. Yeah. So at the very beginning, like when he's lecturing and he's like, you know, absolutely nothing, you know, like, like, um, that's, that's very much what it's like. So um, we don't have the operatory theaters that we used to have. I think that a lot of that kind of got wrecked with HIPAA sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but we do have uh, like a video version of that where with GoPros and cameras and, and, and overhead Zoom cameras that people can see directly like what we see and see the surgical site. So there's wow. is some cool stuff with virtual learning like that. But I, I do really wish if I was, you know, if I, if I had a uh, hundred million dollars to contribute to the college, you know, and I built like the, you know, Sherman house, uh, you know, medical facility or whatever, I would put in an old school operatory theater and, and, but make it, you know, have 500 seats, you know, with, uh, with the surgery at the bottom, um, kind of Victorian style so that people could, you know, really experience it. And I think it's a, it's a good way to learn. And, um, I know that this, you know, just like anybody, the best way that, that students learn is by literally seeing it. And, and I always tell them like, all right, you've seen it one time. Now let's do the learn one, do one, teach one. And, you know, then I listen to them, teach it to somebody else. And I'll say like, and here's the adjustments that you need to make. Um, 
so yeah, I think it's, uh, uh, it's a cool way to learn. And yeah, it's, it's fun how, and, and spontaneous, how you get to go, Oh, what we were just talking about here it is, yeah. you know? So that's yeah. cool. Yeah. So part of the topic that we're going to be discussing and you brought up revolver. So we're going to need to get into that eventually okay. also, um, you discussed pistol caliber and low velocity rifle. Sure. So let's, let's bring Chuck in on this also for what you guys have seen. Is there anything, and obviously shot placement plays a huge part. I've seen photos. I've seen studies of nine mil, just not being sufficient to incapacitate someone for brain shots due to mm -hmm. deflection or something like that. From what you've been seeing, what are you seeing? That's actually, a, I'd rather go that route. What have you been seeing? Um, lots of, of lower caliber stuff. So like um, a lot of like nine millimeter slash 38 special and under um, and a lot of 380s and um, 32s, 25s, 22s, that type of stuff. So I think it's, I think that among the um, criminal element, the idea that small concealable handguns are still um, in vogue, I, at least in this part of the country, um, I think is still factual. Um, <clears throat> and I think that has to do a lot with the mode of dress that um, people have because they're carrying these guns in their pockets, not necessarily in their waistbands because their waistbands aren't necessarily around their waists. And, um, you know, if you carried a large caliber handgun, but your, you know, your, your, uh, your waistline is, or, or the waistband of your pants is, is even with the underside of your buttocks, then that's not really conducive to concealment. Um, and then of course, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think, um, that a lot of it also has to do with what is available. Um, and a lot of those guns, of course, are sourced from, you know, illegal fences and things like that and and you know taken in um burglaries and everywhere else so if you had to make an estimation as to the type of projectile being a full metal jacket or a hollow point are you able to do you have any uh any yeah, reference I'd say almost that? yeah i with rare exception do i see expanding ammunition of any kind most all of it is either like a full lead type bullet or some type of jacketed you know partial jacketed or completely jacketed um you know either enclosed base or an open base type projectile yeah um and um yeah i i have a uh one that i sent chuck not too long ago that i consulted on that was a a case um that took place here where the uh there wasn't any there wasn't any maxillofacial trauma but the uh it involves two participants uh in a you know uh in the uh golden half hour that occurs from when the bar closes to when the parking lot clears out and it was a altercation between um two folks that uh didn't like each other and you know there was a lot of bucking up and then somebody produced a gun and then somebody else did the hey man no we're cool and as he held his hand up the guy shot him um, the round went through his hand and then um, right into his chest, like right into the left side of his chest, um, transected his heart and then hit the back side of his spine. And probably, you know, he was probably killed within seconds, um, you know, actually lost consciousness in seconds um, and then died shortly thereafter. But I have x-rays and, and, you know, photos that I show in my classes of that, um, and it was pretty impressive. It was, and it was 130 grand, 130 grain, 38 special purchased at a Walmart, not less than probably three quarters of a mile from where the shooting occurred. So this is not expanding, um, yeah. you know, Remington green box, uh, air force ball, you know, like 130 grand ball and, um, but very good shot placement and, you know, going through a hand, um, yeah. and, which didn't make any difference at all. And this fella had some fairly thick hands, you know, um, not like that, you know, four inches of, of, of meat in your hand is going to 
do much to stop a bullet that's going to do 30 inches and in calibrated gelatin, but uh, it sure did a number on this guy mm. and with, with zero over penetration. So, um, but I, I, I sent pictures to that of, of Chuck and, and, um, and, um, and I've shown it to a few other people in the community and always thought that was kind of interesting for when, especially when people uh, poo poo the revolvers, you know, and say, yep. um, uh, you know, revolvers suck and, you know, the 38 widow maker and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, yeah, it made a widow for somebody, <laughs> but not for the shooter. Um, so, um, but yeah, indubitably, there was even one that I posted not too long ago that I couldn't tell from the CT scans or from the radiographs that it was either, it's either a 22 or a 25. Um, and it landed, uh, it went through the guy's nose, like right through what we call the ala of the nose right here. Um, and it went into his navel cat, a na nasal cavity, very, very close to the center line, hit the posterior part of his maxillary sinus, kind of did a loop, did a loop, must have flown up and bonked him in the eye, uh, you know, in the actual floor of the orbit, and then fell back down and rested um, kind of in his, uh, in the turbinate area of his nose. Uh, but it deformed in such a way that it actually looks like the flip off emoji. <laughs> Nice. Um, and, and so on the x-ray, when I looked at it, I was like, is this a this? Joke? I showed it, I, yeah, I showed it to one of my colleagues and he was like, that, that bullet is like, you know, telling everybody like, screw you that, uh, you know, this guy, um, you know, that's the luckiest shot of his life. Like it's really should have killed him. And, um, it was also kind of interesting because it sort of screws up another urban legend of, um, 22s and 25s, you know, having really poor performance through intermediate barriers. And um, this was actually a shot through safety glass. And so it went through the glass, you know, must have had some kind of spalling event, but still had enough velocity to go through, you know, a good amount of soft tissue and cartilage, um, bonk around a little bit through relatively thin bone, and then arrest itself in some more soft tissue. So kind of a neat sort of thing. But also makes you go like, man, there's so many variables in play uh, when you talk about these things that you really have to almost look at each case literally on a case by case basis yep. and, and, and sort of chop up the facts because it's so hard to group all this stuff into generalities and speak with um, the way we did back in the 90s with the, you know, the Sanow and, uh, and Evan Marshall stuff about, you know, the percentages of, of this projectile doing this, you know, was kind of thought as being almost an absolute but now we kind of have to think about this a bit more pragmatically and holistically that there really is no absolutes with any of this stuff and and i mean it's not just a roll of the dice from when the projectile um impacts the person it's a roll of the dice every time it passes through anything other than plain air <laughs> including precipitation you know um and and it just it just is is a really neat application of applied physics um, when you kind of get down to the, um, when you remove all of the, uh, the emotion and the, and the, the humanness out of it and just look at it in terms of pure science. It's, it's really quite fascinating. I think. Well, it's just like what Jared Reston urged or but one of the biggest lessons from Jared Reston's interview sure. back in 16 was bullets do funny things when they hit stuff. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So how often are you seeing projectiles going up into the brain and out or up into the brain and still surviving? Uh, well, if, if they, if they go in and they, um, they stay, you know, within the confines of the skull. So they kind of make a, a one-way trip and not a round trip. Um, it seems like those people, you know, tend to, um, you know, kind of take sort of the predictable path that I said, you know, they'll, if they don't die of some other thing, like, um, a major intracranial bleed or, um, massive, uh, intracranial swelling, then they tend to do okay. Now the ones that go like through and through, that's usually a high enough, you know, to punch through the, the outer table of bone, the inner table of bone, go through, uh, brain matter, or brainstem and then come out the other side, you know, that's a good, um, 
four thick pieces of bone that you've gone through plus the bone that's in the middle. Um, and um, that takes quite a bit of, bit of velocity to do that. And when you uh, achieve those kinds of velocities, that's when you reach the you know elastic limits of the tissue mm. and you get you know the cavitation and, and the, um, the, um, the stretch cavity stuff that, that people see a lot you know in ballistic simulants. And, um, and that's when that comes into play. So, you know, if you have a, a hole poked on one side, but it's going so fast, you know, greater than 2000 feet per second, and it has enough velocity to go out the other side after passing through, um, that tissue, then it's probably going to create enough upset that that's going to be a wrap. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So I, I don't see those generally yeah. i mean i don't see those in the emergency room i still see those in a law enforcement capacity but not here um at, more as a crime scene um but not as patients that we're treating yeah yeah and something that, that people probably need to bear in mind the people that you are seeing are the people that survived the initial shot yeah so, <laughs> kind of yeah. a fun little fun little fact there yeah yeah and it's sometimes it's it's kind of a weird thing uh like i think chuck you know, understands this. you probably understand this too, is sometimes I have to think uh, and remind myself, like, what hat am I wearing right now? Yeah. You know, like what, what am I doing? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I'm, I'm, I'm not involved in the law enforcement side of this right now. Um, if I find anything, of course, I'm going to preserve it as though it's crime scene evidence, but, um, I don't have any role in the enforcement capacity here, you know, and I'm just in the rescuer capacity or at that point, you know, the, the medical capacity. So, it's uh it's kind of a funny thing so a lot of people don't really get that you know it's yeah. it's hard to uh to uh uh you know figuratively speaking like holster that guy sometimes and and um you know just focus on the uh reconstructive and rehabilitative efforts there yeah yeah now i know a hot topic that chuck loves to discuss is Wad cutters and 38s that too which i have <laughs> Where, um, light for caliber, fast and light for caliber pistol projectiles. That they, they wow that that looks awesome on gel kind of. Yeah, actually, How, the last saw oh, Chuck. That's what we talked about, and then we also. Um, I don't mean to talk over you, Chuck, but um, it is uh, that's actually what we talked about, and then we actually Chuck was teaching a class where he had a block of of gel and some denim. And I had just gotten some of these, uh, I believe they, they're branded by Ruger and they're called like an ARX. ARX, or yep. And they're they're like perhaps made of like some type of compressed metal yep. fuse. They're so and weird. They look neat. They look like a drill bit. Um, and I think they were 95 grain 38s. Super low recoil, obviously, because there's nothing there. Um, and uh, we shot them both out of, I think Chuck's LCR my 681 and then also out of a 20 inch lever gun um mm. into the uh into the ballistic jolt and that all kind of gives you an i mean i'm no ballistician like chuck is but i think that that's a really neat um in in terms of comparison sake you know going yeah from, what is it one and seven eighths inch barrel to a four mm -hmm. inch 20 inch barrel you really get to see the the full spectrum that that things do and as chuck and i both kind of know and sort of like wink at each other about is you know lever guns like these these um uh you know 38s 357s and then everything in the you know 43 to 45 caliber um pistol round magnum pistol rounds do crazy things out of lever guns i mean really things that people probably underestimate and um at that particular class we also had some 125 grain uh, semi-jacketed hollow points and 357 that I brought. Um, and we shot those into the gelatin block, um, at the same distance, we shot uh, 123 grain wolf out of a uh, AKM and the results were identical. Um, so, you know, it's kind and of identical out of the AKM and out of the lever, right? Not out of the, correct. out of the pistols. Yeah. Well, with the, with the lever. Yeah. Yeah. Lever 357, not comparing the uh, we didn't do the, the, uh, snub and the, yeah. and the, but out of the lever, 
you know, the lever had comparable results to the AKM. So, you know, we always joke about the cowboy assault rifle, you know, but the ballistic uh, results were the same, you know? And, and um, so I think that's kind of a cool thing. Did you guys happen to chrono that as well? We did, uh, day, but I've done it before. Um, how close are they? Remington duty load when I was carrying a revolver was a 125 grain Remington, the full power, they make a mid range. And <clears throat> My gun was fast. You know, some some guns are a little faster than others. Like Glocks tend to chronograph faster because of the polyagonal rifling. My uh, Ruger Security 6 4-inch was uh, running about 1490 with that load when Book was about 1450. Uh, and then out of my buddy's 20-inch Marlin carbine, it was doing 2200 feet per second. Cool. So you got a 125-grain bullet, 2200 feet per second. That's literally you know, the weight and velocity of an AK round. Yeah. There's going to be some variables um, in that uh, it won't have as much reach because it doesn't have the ballistic coefficient. You know, it's not as aerodynamic, things like that. But but at close range, um, all the ballistic potential of each of those bullets would be um, very, very similar, determined by bullet construction more than anything. That is cool. Now you take some of the like uh, <clears throat> Sherman had a. Did you bring up forty four mag or a forty five Colt? You bought a you brought a big thumper one time. Yeah, I brought a. I had a forty five Colt. Um, that trip, I had a twenty inch Rossi three fifty seven, and then a a sixteen inch um, Rossi and forty five Colt as well. Mm-hmm. If you get into the non low velocity loads like uh, 44 Magnums, the souped up 45s, like you get from uh, Garrett or places like that, um, and you put them through a carbine, 44 Magnums easily pick up 400 to 600 feet per second. So you get a, a 44 Magnum out of a carbine can equal some of the old bu- Buffalo rifle loads uh, from the black powder days, uh, which people look back at that technology, but you know what? They would shoot through buffaloes um, pretty regularly. That is crazy. But it kind of goes back to some of the stuff we've talked about in the past, about uh, lever actions ballistically being very similar to AK 7.62 by 3.9. Yeah. So I'm guessing... There's some some cool, uh, you know, I don't know what you'd call it. Like, I guess it's turning into uh old man wisdom kind of thing where, where you know with these older um you know what we now have is like evolutions of what were originally black powder you know era cartridges uh and black powder era guns with smokeless powder you can do some some really 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 cool stuff i mean in the last few years i've really gotten into 4570 stuff for just general purpose whether shooting pigs or for all kinds of stuff. And that's another, yep. That's another really versatile round that you can go from, you know, any personnel, uh, and very, very mild loadings, you know, similar to what they use during the civil war, uh, and after, um, all the way up to, you know, what you can get now, like, you know, Chuck was talking about with Garrett loads and Buffalo bore and some of those ones where it's darn near, you know, 500 grain projectiles that are moving at, you know, close to 2000 feet per second and just, can literally kill anything on the planet. It's insane. Yeah, literally, some of the modern 4570 loads are literally elephant gun capable. Um, yeah. You know, they're, they're up there with the old Nitro Express and things like yeah. that. Yeah. In a gun that weighs like six pounds, you know, six and a half pounds and is relatively short. And, you know, you can put an aim point on or a, or a, uh, you know, a, a scout scope or whatever you want and have a, a very capable. It's, I always kind of say like, it's almost like having a uh, a 12 gauge that can shoot rifled slugs, except you can shoot them out to like 200 yards with pretty good accuracy. After that, they sort of fall off. You know, the trajectory gets pretty steep, but um, but you know, within 200, it's they still hit like very, very, very hard and very predictably. What surprised me with the 4570 was the recoil was not as bad as I thought it would be. It's yeah, it's all it's I don't even think it's as bad as a 12 gauge Magnum slug. It's just a a, a, a push. Yeah, it's worse off the bench like anything. But, you know, I think that uh, 
if you're standing and you get your weight behind it, like it's not that bad at all. Yeah. I was going to say 12 gauge slugs, especially the old full power ones are very underappreciated as far as recoil. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, I picked up a 590 years ago and the only thing I could find at the store was three inch Magnum, one and a quarter ounce slugs. And uh, I have fired guns as large as, uh, well, like 375 H and H, uh, and, and several of the, the 45 caliber, uh, elephant guns, you know, um, I'm trying to think of like outright the biggest elephant gun bullet I fired. Like I know, I know I fired a 577 nitro, um, and that Magnum slug out of that Mossberg shotgun recoiled harder than anything mm. I've ever shot in my life. It was horrible. Yeah. Um, don't buy three inch Magnum slugs. That's stupid. So we were just shooting. I don't know if they were three inch Magnums or two and three quarter, but some kind of heavy Magnum or heavy slug just a couple of days through my 1301. And we were, I think it was like 45 yards uh, clearing the pie plates. It was just fun. Of course we were using a red dot and cheating, but yeah. I'm going to do that with lever guns next. So we got, uh, if you guys don't mind, I was going to circle back because I saw a couple of the chat Please. things. So the two things I saw was every once in a while, I sent vict victims, you know, however they got shot. You know, maybe they're a le legitimate victim, gangbanger, gunfight, something like that, whatever the case may be. Somebody got shot. Sometimes I would send people to guys like Sherman. Um, and then the ones that he didn't see had, had two there were two sides of the coin. Uh, the guys that were DRT, which we saw quite a bit of, because uh, as he noted, if you take something like a nine millimeter ball, uh, 40 caliber flat point, something like that, or even some of the small caliber stuff with a good hit, um, people are literally dead in their tracks. Uh, you get that flaccid paralysis and they drop like a, you know, a puppet falling. But then the other guys that I would run into really regularly, you'd show up on a call. Sometimes it was a shooting. Sometimes it was an unknown disturbance. And you walk up and some guy's got a bloody rag on his head and be like, what happened? Dude shot me. And I've lost track of how many times uh, we have the, the thing that Jim Cirillo talked about. And if you hadn't read your Jim Cirillo, you need to. Guns, bullets, and gunfights is mandatory reading in this business. But... Um, like a case, uh, Sherm, you remember the, uh, the 200 rounds or 200 grain super police, the, yeah. uh, you know, Winchester load, Yep. Neither, neither super nor a police load, but, right. um, it had a very hemispherical, uh, bullet on the nose, very, very round and, uh, was going, I've chronographed some of the original ammo. It was sub 600 feet per second. So, uh, the idea was a big bullet with a lot of dwell time would have stopping power. But one of my old chiefs shot a guy here and here, and both of them got into the tissue, hit bone. And then because of the shape of the projectile, uh, just traveled under the tissue and then exited out the back. Um, and he, he was in a run and gunfight with this guy. And oddly enough, what uh, made the guy drop because he had a, a Walther P-38, a World War II gun. He was shooting at the guy <clears throat> or he was shooting at our chief and they were, they were working around the car. And uh, the chief in that three shot uh, burst when he hit him. One of the bullets had hit him in the arm and it uh, bounced off the humerus and cut the brachial artery uh, on the way out. So eventually this guy just bled enough. He passed out. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that, that was the end of the gunfight, but that sort of thing where somebody got hit and it just travels around. And I've, I've seen that, you know, people talk caliber crap, you know, nine millimeters or they suck and blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I distinctly remember uh, one, it was a, a double shooting, uh, really, really tragic case because they're very legitimate victims. It was a carjacking robbery. They got followed home. Um, two ladies were in a car. Uh, one of them got shot side to side through the chest with a 45 caliber, 230 grain full metal jacket. She died on the scene. The other gal was being accosted by one of the, the other bad guys. And when they killed the first gal, he's like, well, we can't leave any witnesses. 
and shot her in the back of the head, like execution style. And she had enough uh, wits about her. She collapsed and played dead. So the, that 45 caliber round hit the back of her head, went over the top and popped out. And of course, you know, head wounds bleed all over the place and she just laid there and held her breath. So they thought she was dead and they took off. Um, I've seen that with 40 cows. Uh, the, there's a case I talk about where we had a shooting in front of a club and a guy, the guy got hit, heard the shot, got hit, looked back, saw the guy with the gun and then probably did one of the world's fastest 400 yard dashes. Uh, so I'm talking to him after the fact, uh, I was night shift watch commander or, uh, I got guys down at the club. Uh, I'd already been to the scene. So we knew what kind of gun we were looking for because we have 45 caliber brass laying there. Um, and the guy's got a rag on the back of his head, you know, uh, and talking to his buddies and, and he's like, you know, man, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that dude must have had a 22 or something. And I told him, no, you, you got shot with a 40, man. You, you're really lucky. Um, and he looks at me and he goes, what? And I go, well, yeah, we, it was a 40 caliber pistol. And I see his eyes go big and then he passed out. He literally fainted over the thought of it. Um, but I've lost track of how many times I've seen that just over and over and over again. You know, it was something well documented that, that Jim Cirillo, very well documented. And a big part of that is uh, bullet construction, bullet shape, which is why Jim was such a fan. I, I was lucky enough to train with Jim several times and to be able to call him a friend, uh, be able to bounce stupid questions off of him, things like that. And uh, the, that, with that round nose shape, uh, when you think about it, it glances off of things, um, uh, travels through tissue very efficiently without tearing things, stuff like that. And uh, as Sherman noted, you got some very, very hard bone. When I'm in uh, impact weapon class, when I'm talking about, you know, this part of the skull, it's angled like tank armor. It's very thick. It's very hard. It's almost as though it were specifically designed to protect your brain from impact. It's just weird that way, right? And then on top of that, the tissue acts as a lube. So um, think about if you're shooting a steel plate and you have the, those angled steel plates so the bullets go, they're very predictably hit the plate, go down, hit the plate, go down. Well, it's the same thing with a skull, particularly if you go grease the plate so that it's got you know, some lubricant on it, which is what, what we're dealing with here. So like when I teach headshots, um, let's go back to our Star Wars nerd roots. Um, especially with small calibers, I teach people, you have to be like Luke at the Death Star. You know, he just wasn't pounding torpedoes into the Death Star. You have to shoot like for the exhaust port or some place where the torpedo is actually going to get in there. Negative. It only impacted on the surface. <laughs> Luke didn't yeah. get that though. Luke used the force. I think, I think, I think red five blew that one. If I no, he was it. red five. Oh, gosh, okay. come on, Sherm. I don't who it wasn't. Sorry. Bud? Screw that up. <laughs> now, uh, now we're going to have to pull up the original and watch that again. Right. Just, I, yeah. I think we have to cancel the whole the whole modcast now. Maybe it was Gold Leader. Now it was Gold Leader. That's what it was. Could be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, kind of a follow-on, and then, of course, this is just all anecdotal stuff, but it seems like um, what Chuck was saying is these a lot of these folks that are, um, oh, you know, they tend to come from the other side of the tracks um that are you know part of the criminal element that are gunshot wound survivors they've been shot like more than once and so um we had a case the other day where we were trying to find this guy he uh came to us for um treatment of a ameloblastoma which is a benign type of tumor which is actually probably more destructive than a cancerous type tumor would be but we had to remove a whole section of his jaw basically from the corners of his mouth down so he, he just has like uh, almost like the predator uh you know like when the predator opened his mouth and his mandible open like this so you know, there's nothing connecting it so we needed to find a graft site somewhere on his body where we could take a bone and a blood supply to be able to graft this back and turn it back into a jaw well every place that we looked on uh his imaging he'd been shot before so he'd been shot in um, the tibial plateaus of both legs. He'd been shot um, 
in the ribs on both sides. He basically had been shot in all the places that we would normally use for grafting sites. And um, I thought that was funny just because, you know, this guy was, you know, retired from that life largely, you know, he's in his early sixties and um, you know, probably what's going to end up being his demise is, is this, you know, bizarre type of, of uh, benign tumor, but, boy, it wasn't for lack of trying because, you know, he had about nine projectiles still lodged in his body um, at, at various points, all, of course, like medium or small caliber and non-project or non, non expanding. <clears throat> Truthfully, I think uh, when you get into small bullets, uh, you know, we talked about like the 30, 38 snubs, things like that. Uh, if you need to carry something really small, uh, Ruger LCP, 38 snub, things like that. Um, you know, the, the idea of expanding bullets can be very highly overrated. Uh, we know that I think the idea that, that the FBI learned the hard way in 1986 that your, uh, um, you know, your bullet needs to penetrate sufficiently. So the first thing I look for in ammo is, uh, it, does it work? It, if it, it's got to go bang instead of click, right? Is it going to function in the gun? The next thing I look for is, does it shoot accurately to my sights? That's what I'm really worried about. Uh, and if I've got those things, um, you know, functions in the gun, recoil, you know, not crazy recoil, things like that. Um, you know, because <laughs> I, I can get something to penetrate sufficiently and uh, shoots very accurate, accurately to my sights, but do I really want to carry a 454 Casol, you know? Um, but things that we normally carry, and uh, like when I'm picking ammo for my 38 snubs, uh, is it reliable? Does it shoot accurately to the sights? And then the next thing I worry about is any kind of wound ballistics. Uh, so there, there are some of my guns, some of my smaller guns, I'm carrying non-expanding ammunition in on purpose knowing the limitations of the, the gun that I'm carrying. And then some of those that are, that are non-traditional, like wad cutters have a 38 snub, uh, they actually have some advantages over expanding ammunition in that um, <clears throat> they won't over expand and under penetrate. And then they don't have that, that ricochet effect where they tend to stick. You know, that's something that Jim learned early on when he was live fire testing in the middle of a uh, real world incidents. Yeah. Just reinforces that whole uh, that thing about what wad cutters. What? Yeah, I I, I agree with Chuck. I, I think um, uh, you know wad cutters are just neat for a number of reasons. Aside from their terminal ballistic effects, I mean, I have yet. Uh, I'm I'm primarily a Smith and Wesson guy, but also I do have a few of the old school Rugers like Chuck's talking about um, that were service pistols and then also uh, LCRs. But, um, you know, I, I have yet to find um, a 357 slash 38 caliber revolver that has either fixed or, well, of course, with adjustable sights, it doesn't matter. But with fixed sights that I can't get a good point of aim, point of impact um, coherence with. And, um, they are almost like boringly predictable. They're great for new shooters too, because they, you know, you're generally shooting them out of, um, either aluminum or, uh, and even in aluminum guns, they're not that punishing out of steel frame guns. They're very mild. Um, you know, about the w worst thing about them is that they're crappy for speed loaders or for speed strips, you know? Um, but you know, if, if you, uh, you know, the, the chances of you having to reload, I mean, you know, how often does that happen in real life uh, outside of law enforcement incursions? Um, and even then, if you're a guy who opts to wear, or, you know, carry, uh, carry uh, wad cutters for your revolver, you maybe not could be worse off to, to carry your spare ammo in loops. And then you can carry wad cutters to your heart's content. Or just carry another revolver. Yeah, that's the best way to do it. Uh, re regardless of what you're carrying, I'm a big believer in, especially if you're carrying at work, I'm a big believer in carrying two guns because uh, there's, there's a lot of things, um, you know, in, in the age of ammo droughts and people working, you know, uh, 
uh, ammo machines running 365 days a year around the clock, trying to catch up with demand and things like that. Quality control takes a kick in the, uh, in the butt. And, uh, so your, your odds of getting bad ammunition, uh, rise. Uh, and there are certain things like a squib load, you got a bullet lodged in a bore, uh, you blow up your gun because it's an overcharge, something like you can't tap rack and keep going on any of those issues. You know, um, it's not uncommon to get your gun shot. If you look at the FBI Miami fight or, you know, a number of other fights that I, that I can point to, people got shot in the gun hand. They got shot in the gun. Uh, they got shot in the gun and their gun disabled, uh, having being able to grab something else. So uh, even if it's a less capable gun so that somebody can't just walk up and execute you is a pretty, uh, pretty good idea. Yep. Especially since some of these guns are so, they're so easy to carry, you know, um, Stono 38 in the pocket, uh, something like a, a Glock 42 strapped to your body armor strap, something like that. It's very, very easy to have something with almost no load and almost no uh, inconvenience to your lifestyle. Um, you know, it's like putting a pocket knife in your pocket. It's just there. Agree. So we haven't talked about rifle stuff much, especially as far as striking the face. And now when you were talking about low velocity, low velocity rifle, what, what's the window that you're classifying that as? <clears throat> Uh, well, probably just by, uh, you know, it's hard to say because I don't always know like what it was fired with, but I'm oh. guessing, um, less than a thousand feet per second. Um, and maybe even that's a little, uh, strong to the hoop, maybe even like 700 feet per second or less. Um, you know, unless you're in some, um, some of the higher velocity 22 long rifle type rounds, um, which are still probably right around there out of most pistols, I think. Isn't that about right, Chuck? Even like for velocitors and things like that, aren't they right around a thousand? Yeah. Um, the, the, the fastest bullets I've found, uh, 22 snubs are going to be a velocitors and the stingers and uh, they'll push up around a thousand, but almost everything else, real world guns that I've shot, uh, short roll 22s, 32s, 380s, things like Ruger LCPs, that they don't achieve bug velocity at all. And then quite frankly, uh, neither do the snub 38s or like the, the very short 45s. I can remember those uh, when the officer's models were popular, things like Glock 36s, um, you know. Uh, 45 Bully, bully, uh, bullet velocity can drop, you know, easily into the high 600, you know, low 700 feet per second range pretty easy. Um, I can tell you that, uh, if, if you get good bullet design or, uh, decent mass that even, even some ex unexpected things, uh, can be surprisingly capable. Uh, I'll tell you every 22 rifle shooting that I've attended, and I think it's one reason is because the most ubiquitous 22 long rifle loading has been a high speed solid 40 grain. So uh, it's, you get a 40 grain solid bullet. It doesn't, doesn't expand at these velocities running about 1200 feet per second, but every 22 rifle shooting that I've attended has been a homicide mm -hmm. without fail, every single one. And the vast majority of them, people are like, well, you know, if, no, I'm, I'm telling it like they hit the dude once good. Uh, and the guy ran and piled up like a dead deer, you know, um, yeah. it can be surprisingly effective, which in my opinion speaks to, uh, accuracy, which how easy is it to shoot a, a 22 rifle? Uh, even people that don't know how to use the sights tend to point shoot a long barrel gun fairly well. Um, you have a close range event. But if you have accurate hits with a bullet to penetrate sufficiently, you know, that's probably 99% of the problem. Yeah, I agree. Um, I was going to say the one um, specific that I can think of, Chuck might know about this one. I don't know if we've talked about this person before, Chuck, but I, I think you know about it. This occurred in Spokane, Washington, approximately 2000 and two there was an active shooter uh well let's call it a active shooter non-event 
because the active shooter was the only person that was shot. Um, a uh, young disturbed man went to a uh, high school in Spokane, Washington, um, went to his classroom. There was some type of, you know, confrontation. He didn't actually shoot anybody, if I recall. Um, and then the uh, Spokane police, I think they did kind of like the tag team on patrol type concept because, you know, Spokane is quite the wild west out there. Um, and this, uh, the, the purported active shooter was shot, uh, I believe three times in the face with, uh, XTP, uh, out of, out of, uh, 16 inch carbines and, or it might even been commando length carbines. Um, uh, but anyway, he lost, uh, both eyes, most of his mid face, um, and some structures in the neck. However, all of them were non-lethal wounds. Uh, of course, he was, you know, essentially crippled because he was, um, you know, blind. You know, he, his, his uh, orbits were evacuated from his skull. Uh, so it was his nose and a lot of his respiratory structure had to be um, salvaged as best as possible. But he went on to, uh, you know, attempt suicide in the ICU by any number of means um, a number of times because, you know, he was pretty much doomed from then on. But I always thought that was kind of an interesting case because these were all like, uh, you know, obviously skilled shooters, um, you know, not a huge distance that they shot him from, you know, like probably within 10 yards um, and, you know, a, a, around the... Uh, uh, the, um, Hornady, um, and, uh, you know, which is thought of in law enforcement circles as kind of being the gold standard in a lot of places still. Um, but relatively incapacitating of course, but not lethal. Um, so did, did they use, uh, did they use carbines? Was that a two, two, three deal or. I feel uh, like it was, they maybe had like 10.5, uh, or maybe, you know, 12 inch guns, like back when those Colt 69 20s or whatever that was were available for, uh, individual officer purchase. Um, I remember that was kind of a big trend in Washington at the time. Um, but I feel like it was that combined with that, uh, with that round. Um, so we had, uh, that amp you know, I'm, I'm consulting on a shooting locally where we had very poor performance out of one of the, one of the bullets that uh, Doc Roberts would warn against for use in patrol. Uh, and, uh, it was, uh, in this case, Hornady tap 55 grain, which yeah. is a very frangible bullet. Yeah. The things that sold the, the two, two, three, the five, five, six system to law enforcement. when we were pushing patrol rifles was, uh, you know, everybody's worried oh my god you'll shoot through schools and and that sort of thing and uh so you could do ammo demos ballistic gel and things like that to show it was very controlled very uh, actually limited penetration penetrates less than service pistol ammunition so mm -hmm. that that got rifles on the street but then we started seeing problems with um you know, bullets failing to penetrate windshields bullets failing to penetrate deep enough on really big suspects things like that because the yeah you know, they weren't, they weren't anywhere near that FBI 12 inch minimum. And yeah. when you think about it, the bullet was made to self-destruct in something like a prairie dog, because you want the bullet to, to kill a prairie dog very cleanly. Or if you miss, you don't want to ricochet off a rock and send it into a, you know, the farm next door or something like that. So that's it. The bullets are doing what they're designed to do. Yeah. Uh, you have limited penetration in some of these rounds, uh, you know, and I've seen teams using things as low as 40 grain ammo, some of those varmint rounds, trying to get, you know, lack of, they're, they're scared to death of over penetration. Uh, and the, the bullets just explode on the first thing they hit. Mm -hmm. So if you think about skull construction, uh, if you hit like a cheekbone or a jaw or something like that, and that bullet's going to self destruct and stop within a couple inches, there may not be enough penetration to get through. Uh, to get a really de debilitating hit. Yeah. I, I misspoke when I said that, Chuck. I said XTP, but you're right. It was the tap now that I think about it. Um, yeah. And I feel like um, out of that particular gun, I, I feel like the combination of that round and that gun, I, I remember seeing 
I think it only did like seven and a half or eight inches in calibrated gelatin. It was like very, very, very anemic. Um, and, and you're exactly right. Like that's what happened with this particular incident was, you know, as soon as those bullets impacted, you know, near the orbital rim, it was just instant disintegration and, and just, uh, basically like liquefying and avulsing everything that was in there. So, you know, it just kind of looked like, um, everything from like his eyebrows, you know, down to right about mid, uh, uh, mandible was just sort of turned to mush. Um, so yeah, everything in there, you know, I, I think is, uh, um, you know, when you're talking about shot placement earlier and the, the, uh, proton torpedo, um, I also think that the further you get off the midline, um, in a, you know, head on situation, um, or if you're in a, a, you know, a lateral view, the further you deviate from the midline of that, you know, basically staying in line with the, you know, external auditory meatus, you know, your ear hole, if you will. Um, and then the same thing on the back of the skull, anything that you deviate from center really decreases your chances of effectiveness, you know, midline structures, um, they are where all of the everything important is and also those are the worst areas to heal um a lot of the times a lot of times the the blood supply there is is really good but it overlaps in a weird way and it doesn't heal well you know so um a lot of times if you have people that have even been shot there but they end up you know not dying in the immediate they'll die of of secondary complications just because of the uh problems involved with you know healing complications so yep. when i'm teaching uh spe particularly with handguns when i'm teaching the whole like headshot thing uh talk about how small these targets are you know yeah uh, and and uh i think we in the particularly in the past we shot in the police world uh, at unrealistically large targets uh, even if you're going for center of mass um, the, your a human beings, uh, heart is roughly about the size of their fist. You know, if I raise my thumb, it's kind of like the aortic arch. You put it there in, a, in the center of your chest, you realize how small a target that is to be very, to, for be very effective. You can poke holes in lungs, uh, and quite a few of them before you start to have some effect and that can take a while. Um, but if you think of like a Halloween uh, jack-o'-lantern or like, like a skull, like a, a cartoon of a skull, um, like when I was in sniper school, they were very adamant that we shoot for this T-zone. Um, and you think of a skull, what it looks like without the tissue, you got the nose hole and you got the eye holes and that those, those are those death star exhaust ports that lead to, um, what you're trying to shoot actually. Yep. Uh, so that's what I teach to aim for. And it's a very, it's a very small area. Yeah. That, the last time I trained with you, Chuck, you were still using that, you were using that VTAC target that has like the little credit card. And, mm -hmm. and I think that that's, you know, if you can, uh, very good target. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's a good, uh, very good analog for that. Like very <laughs> few people are that, you know, from the, the lateral portion of their orbit to the other side is going to be you know, much bigger than a credit card. And, and I'd say that even when I think about that, um, I even think about from, um, like what we call like the, uh, w basically what is like the outer edge of your, of your iris on both sides. And if you look and you draw a line on bald guys like us, Chuck, you can see that that's, that stops almost right at the division uh, or the union of the frontal portion, uh, the frontal bone of our skull and the parietal and the temporal all kind of connects right there. So that's, uh, you know, by design, like you said. Um, and if you sink one in there, the chances of it going laterally far enough out to the side and, and escape without hitting anything major is, is very, very slim. If it's inside the pupils, it's, that's a money shot. So I was in, uh, I was taking Jared Reston's pistol class. I think it was, it would have been last year. And uh, <laughs> I think to avoid any uh, complications about uh, being politically correct, you know, Jared's target is Jared. Uh, mm. 
So his his target and so it's a picture of Jared and it's got like the you know the the area that you're shooting for. And he's walking by coaching people. He walks by and one of the guys had honked on the trigger when we we're going for headshots and uh hit him right here. And he walks by and he just said, dude, those jaw shots don't work and walked off. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that that was it, it was it was funny in context, uh, uh, big time. But oh, yeah, know, it definitely knows what he's talking about. Yeah, firsthand experience or something. And, and that's another case. You know, we were talking about small calibers. Jared got like shot in the face with a forty-five. Uh-huh. Um, and that's uh, that's what that was his notice that he was being invited to a gunfight. Um, yeah. And uh, he was able to prevail. A lot of mindset, things like that. But also, um, when you hit jaw, when you hit teeth, uh, that that that's a any any pistol bullet is going to have a whole lot of trouble uh, impacting that. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Sherman, but teeth are as far as like hardness, probably the hardest thing on your body. That's correct. Yeah, that's the hardest thing in your body. Yeah, ninety six percent inorganic. Hmm. So. Um, yeah, that's, that's a, a good point. I was going to say, Chuck, that you, you've seen this case before Chuck, cause I put it in my presentation, but I had a patient that actually walked into my office, um, when I was still working, uh, in the hood and, um, in a different hood. <laughs> now I work in the North before I worked in the South. But, um, when I was working there, a guy actually walked in and his chief complaint was, I got shot in the face, but now I'm having trouble with water coming out my nose when I drink water and I can't open my mouth. And um, so, you know, the, whether there's any veracity to the background of this story or not, I'll leave it up to you. But um, because I can't firsthand verify it, I just know what the end result was. But he had a, a, a small laceration underneath his right eye, um, the bullet which on examination was, this is one of the few, Matt, that I've seen that was actually with an expanding projectile. Um, but this wasn't a, uh, this shooting didn't occur in the United States, apparently that occurred in Mexico. And then the guy uh, immediately exfiltrated the country and came to the United States where he thought he'd be safe. That's his story, but I can't you know, say whether it's true or not. But anyway, um, shot, underneath the eye with the hydro shock, it went in, hit the posterior portion of the rearmost portion of his maxillary sinus, kind of did a loop de loop um, and spun down. And if you imagine, uh, if you put your fingers on top of your rearmost teeth and you kind of push your finger back a little bit further, there is a piece of bone that sticks down called your maxillary tuberosity. And that's actually the base of your skull. That's the rearmost portion of the upper part of your head. Um, it blew that part out along with that piece of bone, along with three teeth attached to it. He either spit that out or he swallowed it. I'm not sure which, um, but that creates a pretty big wound that bleeds a lot because there's two, um, uh, there's your maxillary artery there that is, is feeding that. And that's a good sized bleeder. Um, so he bled quite a bit from that, but then the bullet, after it hit those teeth and that bone, then it did kind of a funky thing where I don't think that the hydroshock would normally do this if it had hit something else, but the uh, pointy portion with the post of the, of the lead spun off in one direction and the jacket stayed on the other side. So he actually had a piece of the the jacket portion lodged on one side and then the lead portion lodged on the other. And, um, so, and it spun from one side of his mouth to the other, but it didn't go through his cheek and it locked itself up on the inside of the lateral conduct. And that's what was like, basically, if you, you know, like a wheel chalk or a door chalk was kind of keeping his mouth from being able to open because he couldn't, you know, allow his musculature to pull his jaw forward to open his mouth. So he was just drinking out of a straw, but when he would drink out of a straw, it would all come out his nose because he had this communication now between his nose and his mouth. Um, so it required some surgery and some grafting repair. Um, and it was a mess, but you know, the moral of the story is, is he literally got shot at point blank range. Um, 
maybe even contact distance. It was hard to tell from the wound, but it wouldn't have surprised me. And he got, you know, he lived. Uh, I mean, he was, yeah, disfigured and debilitated and is going to have a lot of problems um, for the rest of his life with his jaw and his speech. Um, but he lived. So that's a, a, a kind of a strange, one of those weird ones too, where if, if you would have told me, hey, uh, you know, here's the crime scene. This guy walked up, you know, puts a, a 1911 right up to this guy's, underneath this guy's eye, says F you and pulls the trigger. And then this guy wakes up five minutes later, bleeding out his nose and his mouth and his face and, you know, grabs a towel and some bandages, packs a bag and heads from uh, Mexico to Austin to Amarillo to Nashville. I'd be like, okay, that's an awesome fairy tale. You know, like, where does the rest of this movie take us? You know, but it's like, no, this is real life. Um, so it's just kind of a weird, weird sort of thing. But, um, and then that story kind of came full circle for me because that happened in uh, about 2014, I believe it was. I have to look at the article when I originally wrote it, but um, that happened. And then I was at TACCON in 2019 and I was at Dr. Topper's lecture on ballistics and he pulls that up and he starts giving kind of a case review of that. And I, and, and the facts were a little bit wrong or well, not a little bit wrong. They were wrong. And so I raised my hand and I said, well, that's not completely true. And it kind of reminded me of that scene in the old 1989 movie, Batman. Remember like where they were in his armory and they were like making fun of all of his suits of armor. And um, this, he says, this guy must've been King of the wicker people. And Bruce Wayne walks up and he goes, uh, actually, it's Japanese. And he goes, yeah, well, how do you know? And he goes, because um, I bought it in Japan. So it was, it was kind of like that. So then Dr. Topper was like, hey, well, come on up here and tell us about this case. And, and so I did. And, um, he, and then I sent him my notes and he changed his presentation. So it's kind of funny because it was one of these ones where, you know, the urban legend came, became, uh, you know, a guy got shot in the face with a 230 grain federal hydro shock. And um, all it did was make him go to the dentist. Well, kind of, but not really. You know, there was a lot more to it than that. Um, and it, it, you know, it's not like he showed up and I flossed his teeth and went home or something like that. It's just a regular routine cleaning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just buffed out a couple spots and on his way. Here's your free toothbrush. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for dropping by. Yeah. And believe it or not, not like the uh, the time that a gunshot wound victim came to the office uh directly after happening another time it was a as a guy that had been shot three times with a 22 um not anywhere near the face uh once in the femoral uh once in the shoulder and once in the subclavian artery and um or well i mean it was shot up here but it was bleeding from the subclavian artery and um that was one that you know resulted in tourniquet application and uh nashville fire department and police department showing up so um that was a, uh, like Chuck said, I, I don't think that that guy survived. He, he had already lost like a tremendous amount of blood. And when they rolled up, he was sitting in the passenger seat of a Honda Civic. And when they opened the door and blood actually fell out of the door, like, like he dropped it like a water balloon. I was like, wow. I mean, it was a tremendous amount. So, um, same kind of thing. Um, in that case, that guy was actually, in some type of love triangle kind of thing, like a lot of these things are. And a guy was rolled up to his work site because he was with two other of his buddies and they were all wearing uh, fluorescent orange, you know, hard hats and construction equipment. And uh, the guy said, you know, screw you, sir. And uh, bang, bang, bang. And the guy fell off the roof and, and then his buddies collected him in the car. And, drove him to the nearest place where they could get medical attention, which was us. So I'm either really lucky or really unlucky, but maybe they're lucky. I'm not quite sure. <clears throat> so uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about, cause I think it's a mindset issue and not everybody gets to carry what they want. 
Um, I've, I've talked about this before. I've done like Facebook posts, uh, had, a, had a conversation with uh, Caleb Giddings and he wrote a deal for his blog on this. And uh, the whole idea, it's been going around my whole career. Man, you know, you, you, you're carrying a 38, you're going to be killed in the streets or, you know, you're carrying a nine millimeter. And back in the day, we needed to get 40s. We needed to get 45s. We needed to get... Uh, 357 six, you know, all of, all of these things and are looking for a hardware solution to a software problem. And it's just out of touch with reality. Uh, the, I've seen, I've seen 45s fail, nine millimeters fail, 357 magnums fail. Um, like uh, uncle Pat talked about, he's seen a lot of people turned into canoes by 22s, 32s, 380s. Um, and so when you're talking about a, a failure to stop event, um, then the first thing you have to look at is what critical structures in the person that was shot were involved because, you know, a 44 Magnum to the pinky toe is a, is a pinky toe. I mean, that's, that's all there is to it. Right. Uh, one of the reasons I bring this up is I have a, a buddy on a very high action um, police department right now, and they have nine millimeters and some of the troops they've had a number of officer involved shootings are like, well, you know, this did beat us. We need to get uh, this bull, you know, do we need to do, no, the, the bullets work fine. Guys, 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 if you shoot people around the edges, it really doesn't work. That's all there is to it. Um, one of the incidents that I talk about is uh, my dad was a Vietnam vet. He was in an air cavalry unit in his uh, last tour in Vietnam. And I met one of the guys that he flew with in Vietnam, uh, Mr. Shimke. And he was a Cobra pilot at the time, you know, Cobras are tandem and that, you know, the, the pilots back here and the gunner sits in front, it's a very narrow aircraft. So one bad day in Vietnam, they took a bunch of rounds while they were shooting up bunker complex. And, uh, it was either 12.7 or, or 50 cal, whatever it was, but, um, uh, went through the front of the aircraft, killed the gunner, went all the way through Mr. Shimke and then, shot his engine out of his Cobra and he dropped out of the sky. So uh, he took 250 caliber rounds um, and they were right here and here, right? And then when I met him, I was a, a grade school kid and my dad was assigned to a unit in Germany. And I saw Mr. Shuki, you know, we had a bunch of people, we were at a pool and he, he looked like he had three belly buttons uh, from the scarring and two of them on his back. So he lost about eight feet of intestine out of that deal, but he was still healthy enough to be on flight status. Wow. And ironically, he crawled out of his aircraft and uh, was, was trying to get away. And uh, pilots were high value. Like if you captured a pilot, it was a big deal. You know, we, we, some of the incidents we know about like bat 21 and things like that, you know, um, but ironically, he carried a Colt Woodsman 22 in a tanker holster when he was flying. And he killed a guy with that as part of his escape. So uh, we had basically a failure to stop with 250 caliber rounds through a dude's torso because they didn't hit anything that was immediately vital to his life function. You know, the, he lost a test intestine, he lost a lot of tissue, lost a lot of blood, um, but he was healthy enough to be back on flight status once he was healed up, you know? Um, and when people ascribe some of these things to, uh, well, that's because, you know, this. No, you have to, you have to look at what happened. Um, you know, the nine millimeter got a really bad rap after the 1986 uh, Miami uh, gunfight with the FBI. But I'll tell you what, um, you know, everybody blamed it on the nine millimeter. We need to get whatever. Uh, had they been carrying 45 caliber silver tips, which were also uh, in, in, invented and introduced at the same time as the nine millimeter silver tip, they had even worse penetration. They would have had less effect on Platt when he got shot. Um, but I'm telling you that people wouldn't have said, well, we need to dump the 45, it sucks. They would have said, we need to get better bullets. Um, and that, that's where this kind of mindset thing gets really annoying. Um, they're not death rays. Uh, you know, we, at my old job, we ended up shooting a lot of people, 124 grain plus P nine millimeter gold dots. And we never had a bullet failure. They always performed the way they were. They always mushroomed. They always penetrated sufficiently. They did really good through uh, intermediate barriers. It's just a superb load. 
Um, one of my guys got into a chase, car crashed, bad guy jumped out of the car with a pistol in each hand and was running, angling away, and then trying to like shoot backwards. So uh, our guy hit the bad guy through the scapula and then it came out as peck. So as far as like uh, critical structures, it went through the lung, but it didn't hit uh, like the pulmonary artery or any of the big bleeders or anything like that. Uh, our guy, cause he was tracking the guy running. He said when he fired, the suspect immediately collapsed. And he said it was like the rhino on 300. The guy was sliding in his face, on his face in the dirt. So uh, after that, some of the guys came into the armory and they're like, man, when, when are we going to get 45s? This is bullshit. And I asked them to explain to me where in the instantaneous incapacitation of that suspect that the bullet failed. Right. Whoa, uh, you know, it, my, as, as uh, uh, Sherman knows, uh, modern emergency medicine and trauma medicine is very good. There are people who are alive now who would be homicide victims five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. There's no possible way they would have survived. So we can't ascribe lethality as a thing with bullets. I mean, they either do what we design them to do or they don't. Uh, and then what it hits on the person is a little, I mean, it's a part of it's a marksmanship problem. Part of it's a slightly random but um, when medical technology works, um, I, I don't know what we're upset about. Mm -hmm. yeah. this, this was a point that uh, Jeff Carpenter explained years ago to me that I really appreciated because I was trying to tell my department, hey, we should probably go to nines and ditch 40s. And this was, I don't know, I don't know how, I don't remember how long it was, but basically it was, well, consider all the gunshot wounds or all the dead bodies that you have to deal with. How many would be more dead because they were using a different caliber. Mm, none. Yeah. And, and what would that little tiny difference between the projectiles really would, is someone going to die because of that little tiny difference? No, it's shot placement. Yeah. 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 And like, like Chuck was saying, I think that, you know, even my um, experience with that guy had been shot with the, uh, with the hydro shock, you know, from a 45, like anybody that's a learned person in this industry knows that, you know, 45 caliber hydro shocks, um, tend to do a pretty good job, um, if they're delivered correctly. And, but even in that guy's case, you know, a shot to the face and then he was incapacitated for what he reports had a loss of consciousness for five minutes. So in that time, does that give a regular person, you know, a regular, uh, civilian defender, as I call them, you know, time to leave the scene, you know, and get to an area of, of safety and call for law enforcement? Absolutely. You know, in a law enforcement context, would that be enough time to affect an arrest? Absolutely. Like, um, you know, I don't know about the military context, but I mean, if you're trying to kill somebody, then I guess that that didn't accomplish that mission. But in the in what we're concerned with, you know, as far as law enforcement or civilian capacity, like, you know, I don't see that as a failure of a 45 or a failure of a hydroshock. Um, at all. I think that that was a hundred percent effective. And, and then uh, just kind of like the tag along about Chuck's story um, with the, uh, with the uh, Cobra shooting is what's crazy and, and sticks out to me, like that I feel is like the stinger on the end of that story, Chuck, is that he took two 50 cows to the torso and then he clipped a dude with a 22 and, and killed him, you know, like, so that's crazy. That's uh that's great. Yeah, that's, that's the really ironical part of that story was uh, how it went down. You know, he's carrying a Colt Woodsman and, and it's, it's 22. Yeah. Uh, you know, they were they were issued 38 revolvers and he had that gun. So he just he carried that because that's what he liked because he was a really good shot with it. Um, yeah. He didn't have that gun anymore because uh, when they when they evac him, he ended up losing it. Somebody's probably got a really cool souvenir, but yeah. Uh, Later in life, uh, I had occasion to go shooting with him, and uh, that dude could shoot. Uh, I think, I think he had a Ruger by then, but uh, you know, guns like that, he could shoot it, like shoot thumbtacks on so draw. When it was time to change the bullseye target, he would shoot the thumbtacks out and let it drop, and then go up and put another one in. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, 
and and talking about you know again the proton torpedo and the shot placement i mean you know those cobras are literally only like a yard wide i mean guys like our size when you sit in it like you're if you put your arms at your side your elbows are are touching the side walls of the cockpit you know it's that's a tiny uh tiny aircraft to be able to lace 250 calibers right center line that's insane yeah they uh well <laughs> he told me they were going down doing a uh, recon by fire type of thing and they were shooting up a bunker complex looking for a reaction and right Unfortunately, they got more than they uh, expected, you know? Yeah. But, yeah, so I, I guess my point is it, I think it's a failure in mindset yeah. Yeah. to describe uh, victory or loss to, to these sorts of variables, you know? If you look at, uh, you know, Audie Murphy was carrying ball ammo. Sergeant York was carrying ball ammo. Jim Cirillo, for a, quite a bit of his career, was carrying round nose lead. Uh, yeah. Pat Rogers never carried a jacketed hollow point on duty during his entire career. Uh, and that's a, you know, he, he talked about pistol effectiveness and things like that and having long conversations with him. You know, he had a, he had a, incident in Vietnam where he double tapped a guy three times in a row before the guy stayed down and he was using an M14 rifle when he did it. So he shot a guy six times with a 308 and the guy kept getting back up. That's because it was an M14. <laughs> uh, it, it deducts damage points from the projectiles. Yeah, um, exactly. But with his uh, 38 semi wide cutters that he, that he uh, carried as a cop, he said, you know what? they work pretty good if you can shoot. And I think yeah. that's the secret is it all works pretty good if you can shoot uh, for the most part. And none of it works pretty good if you can't. Yeah. Um, I think there's dumb stuff out there. Like, you know, Sherman was talking about that Ruger ARX. It's an underweight plastic round nose bullet that does minimal damage. Uh, no more so than, than full metal jackets or, you know, the RIP bullets or glazer safety slugs, things that, that fragment. Well, all these have a marketing and they're all they're all very appealing to lowest common denominator users who don't shoot, who don't study, who don't put in their due diligence. Because there as as this whole discussion is, has shown, there's so much nuance and it's not just this round that's going to that's going to save it or save the gunfight. It's not this gun. It's the whole package to include myself and my training and being able to apply that. Well, that's, that's kind of the thing. Like I hate to, you know, quote myself, but at the beginning of this conversation, you know, we talked about there being, um, you know, that I, that I said, one of the things that fascinates me about, you know, looking at the terminal effects of all this is, you know, actually analyzing the science, but removing all of the humanness, you know, all of the emotion and the political correctness and all this from it. And when you look at things like with an unjaded eye like that um, and just looking at it in terms of scientific criteria, that means things that are measurable. Um, and you look at it in the smallest terms, which is the movement of electrons, um, then you uh, really look at this in a way that removes all of that. And that's the difference between people that are, you know, true technicians of this craft and i don't mean technician in a pejorative sense at all no, no or you know actual students of this and understand um how all of the moving pieces work why um you know the things like the uh you know the gimmick bullets of you know gimmick bullets i don't think that a lot of people realize are not anything you know new there, any no yeah and that's a matter of fact that's something that chuck harps on all the time and people just they don't listen yeah, I remember when there was guys when I was a cadet, you know, that were still carrying um, full cylinders or full magazines of Glazer safety slugs, you know, in their service pistol. And I, I don't remember what it was, Chuck. I don't remember if they came in five packs or six packs, but I remember there was a there was a one dude one time I went into the squad room and he was loading up his P two two six and he had it like you know probably five or six of those blister packs there to load up you know, his, his duty mag plus his spare mag. And then his other spare mag had ball ammo in it, you know, for if they were behind cover kind of thing. And this was the early nineties, you know, so that was sort of the way of thinking was you could either have penetration or you could have terminal effect, but you couldn't have both. 
And there probably was some truth to that, except the older guys that were sitting in the back corner, you know, that all carried either Smith and Wesson model 19s or 66s or 581s or 681s, you know, were kind of like drinking their coffee and carrying 125 grain, you know, Remingtons, I think it was, that were semi-jacketed hollow points that were all laughing and drinking their coffee saying, yeah, okay, kid, keep loading your glazer safety slugs there, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not anything new by any means, and it's probably one of those things that's going to go on forever, yep. but it's also be the difference between um, the, uh, the, the learned – and the people that actually know, and then everybody else who are the people that primarily read the ads. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what you described as the, the, the true technicians of the craft, that's almost one of the tenets of primary and secondary. We, we try to remove the human element and we're focused on, okay, what are the results Yeah, and explain why. And you know yeah. what, we, we can find real good answers that way. And that turns off, that makes so many people angry because we're, we're not going to give in to this. Well, this is my favorite. This is because yeah. yeah. it feels good. No, I don't care. It probably goes for just about anything related to this kind of stuff. You know, it, the people that constantly poo poo Brazilian jujitsu, like they don't have, um, you know, they they are proponents of other types of martial arts that, don't have a demonstrated street record, you know, but they have perhaps maybe flashier marketing or cooler YouTube videos, you know, and, and um, I think we're all old enough to remember, you know, like back when combat handguns and guns and weapons for law enforcement and those magazines were the periodicals that you had before the internet existed. And, you know, you'd read the articles, but you'd also like look through all of these crazy ads that were in the back, you know, like, that's where I got my first pair of uh, Eagle grips, you know, was from the ad. Um, and that's where you could get the glazer safety slugs. And that's where you could get, you know, all the stuff that was flashy and cool. And, and some of it was cool. Like for example, um, I remember that was where I got my first um, VHS tape of Clint Smith. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of that stuff was fluff back in the eighties and the nineties. And it's, and it's still fluff now. It's just the delivery mechanism is different. And, um, and it leaves us with the exact same problem as it was before. There's the people that, you know, are reading critically for content um, and scientific veracity. And then there's people that are reading for entertainment value and they don't understand that the entertainment value um, is not applicable to the real world to anything other than entertainment. It's like getting your... Um, your carry recommendations from what Arnold Schwarzenegger carried in his latest action film. It's analogous to that. And it has just as much applicability, which is to say in the real world, none. So Amen. I've been doing this long enough. I find myself sometimes in a role of tactical historian. Um, mm -hmm. Something I've seen more and more lately is uh, people trying to justify why, why they're carrying ball ammunition well, you know, I want enough penetration. I want to be able to shoot through this, shoot through that. I can tell you back in the day, uh, like I, I did hostage rescue um, training with uh, LAPD SWAT. And at the time they were carrying, uh, I forget which jacket at hollow point in their 1911s, but then they carried backup magazines of full metal jacket. Uh, and their reasoning was, and it seemed pretty strong at the time, is that if they had to shoot somebody through a windshield or something like that, they wanted the extra penetration, they would use the full metal jacket. And then otherwise, like doing a hostage red, open air shot, they would use a jacket at hollow points. Um, makes a lot of sense in the times with the ammunition they had. Uh, something people don't know about is uh, back in the day when you had full metal jacket ammunition that you purchased, um, I, I probably need to take pictures of some of this, throw it up on the IG or something. But uh, nine millimeter ball back then or 45 caliber ball back then wasn't what it is now. There was only uh, ball ammo, which was military grade ammunition. It wasn't made to be uh, the Winchester white box stuff. It wasn't made to be the really low price burn it up training ammo, ammo that we have nowadays. 
people did not do thousand round classes, 2000 round classes, like some of these guys do in a weekend. Um, so when you bought full metal jacket, what you bought was the quality control uh, of a military service pistol ammunition. You don't get that anymore. Uh, the, about the only thing you can still buy like that is one of the nine millimeter NATO loads. Like uh, um, Federal will sell some. Magtech sells a very good 124 grain NATO load in nine mil. And it has uh, the flash suppressed powder. It has a waterproof primer. It's got the same quality control that you have from certain like uh, your high end, like a uh, uh, gold dots or HST or something like that. Extra quality control goes into this service ammunition. Um, the other thing ball ammo doesn't have is it does not have a bonded bullet. So performance through barriers can be just as variable as it is with jacketed hollow points. Although when they hit tissue, they are always going to penetrate sufficiently. It's very common. Um, the problem is that you can shoot through two or three people in a row with these rounds. Um, but so ironically, they don't really penetrate cover or barriers better, like when you're shooting through cars and that sort of thing. So uh, that's why we have the best of both worlds nowadays. Like the, the performance we had with the 124 plus P gold dot out of our nine millimeters at my old job, uh, they penetrated car doors well. They penetrated very well through other barriers like uh, windshield glass, um, drywall, stuff like that. And then uh, on an open air shot, they expanded and penetrated sufficiently. Virtually every shooting we had with one of these bullets, and you can put uh, like the critical duty or uh, HSTs, things like that, all into this category. You would hit a large grown man with a solid hit. It would go all the way through their torso, uh, front to back, side to side, and either lodge in the skin on the other side or exit and fall on the ground. Um, I can tell you one of the shootings that one of my guys had was a dude trying to run him over with the car and he put a shot through the driver's glass. It hit the guy in the arm, went through his humerus, shattered his humerus. And he didn't find that funny. No. Uh, uh, and, you know, exited the arm, entered the armpit, went cross chest, cut the aorta, broke the rib and then was lodged in the uh, tissue on the far side. Um, the last shot went through uh, the glass uh, at a back angle because he would, he sidestepped the car like a bullfighter when he fired. And uh, so the last one went through glass, went through the seat, went through the scapula, hit his heart with enough velocity that it split the left and right ventricles into two pieces, broke the eight, nine rib on exit. And then because the way the guy was cranking the wheel, it hit him in the wrist, uh, penetrated the soft tissue between the radius and ulnar bone, popped out and fell on the floor. Um, and both of those were 124 grain uh, Ranger T, so a plus P jacket at hollow point. Um, so when people talk about, well, I want to have enough penetration, dude, uh, there, there's more than plenty involved with these well-designed loads. Um, and, but they don't have excessive in that, uh, like a, a nine millimeter NATO round can shoot clean through a grown man and kill somebody a hundred yards away rather easily. So just to reiterate something that you said earlier for Chuck, with your <clears throat> with your personal selection of pistol rounds, you are looking for consistent function, consistent accuracy, consistent penetration, consistent expansion in that order. Is Pretty that much. accurate? Yeah. Yeah. Once uh, first, it's got to be reliable. Then it's got to be accurate. Once I take care of those, make sure penetration is sufficient. Once penetration is sufficient, I look at is it more than sufficient. Um, like a, like a 40 caliber jacketed, uh, flat point will penetrate something like 56 inches of gelatin. If I remember right from my testing, think about three gelatin blocks. Yeah. Um, you know, you're shooting completely through a cow versus a person, you know? Um, now once, once you get more than sufficient penetration, then I start looking at bullets that expand to attenuate some of that. Um, my analogy is, I, I don't really think, you know, back me up on this, Sherman, my talking with everybody I've talked to, jacketed hollow points don't actually create that much more wounding or trauma. 
but it's more of in a police service role. It's kind of like a dragster going down the drag strip. If the parachute doesn't pop, what happens? The dragsters through the wall and into the neighborhood, right? Uh, well, that's what we're trying to avoid. Um, you know, the graveyards are full of people. Like, like a, look at World War II. How many Jack at a hollow points were involved in World War II? The answer is none. Um, everybody that was that was shot was you know that died from being shot got shot with ball ammunition um you know i have a buddy that has been involved in about 20 shootings with a nine millimeter nato uh overseas and uh, to steal his quote uh, none of none of the people that got shot were unimpressed with the cartridge but he could shoot real really good um so then what we're looking for is you, you do get a little bit, uh, you, you do get a little bit of extra wounding effect, but uh, it's a much more controlled penetration that I'm really looking for at that point. Yeah, my understanding with pistol wounding characteristics, you're not looking at anything, at least nothing overly measurable that's gonna be bigger than the diameter of the projectile expanded or not expanded. Mm -hmm. Unlike a rifle, which we have more permanent, just like uh, uh, what Sherman was talking about with uh, going beyond the elasticity of, of, uh, of the tissue, which uh, rifle wounding creates. You know, and that's where, that's where I would say uh, what we were talking about before, if I was looking at picking bullets, um, you know, uh, modern, the modern search for a better 5.56 five, past green tip is, is, an, is an example, or if I was in a world where I was carrying AKs, uh, you can easily find ammunition that functions the weapon com perfectly. You know, it's two mil spec. It's designed for that gun. It works really, really well. Quality control is high. It's accurate. So uh, the bullets penetrate more than sufficiently. But now we want to look at effectiveness. Um, you know, Doc uh, Fackler, Doc Roberts, in my personal uh, observation, I've seen several people shot with AKs where the wounding was no greater than like 380 full metal jacket because the bullet didn't upset and it just poked poked in one side and it went out the other. So that it had an ice pick type wound. And that would definitely be a case where you want to look at a bullet that has more enhanced uh, um, performance to it, you know? So for rifles doing that, doesn't that mean it just has insufficient velocity to achieve permanent... Uh... No, no, some of it, if you look at the classic, like the M43 AK round that was mm -hmm. ubiquitous in the Chinese and Russian forces, it was just a bullet design. Um, mm. Even at point blank range, the bullet would hit with full velocity, but it had such a late yaw cycle that it would be in one side and out the other before it did anything. Mm. Um, with M855, uh, it is, uh, it, it's, the, the term is fleet yaw. Yeah. So uh, sometimes the bullets yaw, sometimes the bullets don't, and it can vary from like if you test it out of one gun that exhibits more more yaw versus a different gun, you'll see variable results. So on average, M855 actually works real well. Like Kyle Lamb speaks very highly of it, and Paul Howe hates it, and they were in the exact same fight in uh, Black Hawk Down, right? Um, but Kyle was lucky enough, his, his rifle wasn't exhibiting fleet yaw issues. And then obviously Paul's was, cause he was, he was penciling people and they were going in and out. So even at, at very close range with uh, 20 inch guns or 16 inch guns that they were using at the time, they would shoot people, you know, 20, 30 yards away. So clearly full velocity of the bullet, but the, the bullet was too stable going through and it wouldn't upset to give that fragmentation that is so classic with 5.56. Five, and I think one other thing that Bears uh, mentioned here, Matt, and Chuck will back me up on this, is a lot of people that, that aren't familiar with this or just looking at this in a superficial capacity don't grasp that um, whether it's clear ballistics gel or calibrated, uh, you know, ballistics gel made to FBI specifications, the penetration numbers that are recorded in the tissue simulants are not one to one applicable to mammalian targets. Yes. Meaning that, you know, if, if, you know, we shoot for 12 to 18 inches of penetration in tissue simulant, 
but what that is is that is a homogenous meaning it's made out of only one thing and there is no barriers nor is there any type of container in there that has the ability to affect the fluid dynamics so you know when we're shooting um our, our brain is relatively homogenous i mean our gray matter portion of our brain in its construction however um, the container that it's inside amplifies the uh, characteristics of that wound by either containing it or not containing it. Um, same thing goes for, you know, um, our mid face and our, and our lower face. You know, you, we've all seen pictures and heard anecdotal stories. Um, and I've seen a number of these where people have tried to attempt suicide and end up, you know, just, using their their mouths basically as a conduit for pressure and it just turns into a giant pressure relief valve destroys everything in their mid face um but they their 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 brain essentially is unaffected or just affected superficially um so the moral of the story here is that at that same time um when chuck and i were messing around with the lever action and the small guns um, that 45 long Colt that, uh, that I used that Chuck was talking about, we shot gel with that. Uh, and that was the, I think it's a 225 grain, um, Hornady lever. I think Sherman froze up. Yeah. He got stage fright. Yeah. If, uh, I, where I oh, think there he is, he's back. You got me back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we were using that 45 Colt uh, on the on the gel, but earlier that day we also shot a pig with it uh, in a couple of different spots, both like a transcapular shot from laterally from one side of the shoulder blade to the other, um, and then also in the head. And the results were ridiculous. Uh, I feel like Chuck, you can refresh my memory, but I, I feel like it went it transversed the entire block, including the four. Um, the four plies of uh, denim and we recovered it from the backside of the block in the additional denim that was hanging off the side. Um, and it expanded to a pretty impressive diameter. It was around 75 or 80 caliber recovered. Um, when we shot it into the pig, uh, it went about six inches. <laughs> so, so I, the, the block is 18 inches Chuck or 20 inches. Is that right? Those were uh, those were sixteen inch blocks. Okay, I'll tell you something that I have noticed. Uh, Doc Roberts, Doc Fackler talk about the, uh, the the escape drag effect of of skin on uh, penetration when a bullet's trying to exit. Mm -hmm. so it expands. It uh, you know skin is elastic. You can you can pull on it. Well, the the bullet will hit that skin and the skin will stretch out. And that's at least four inches of tissue penetration equivalent. Uh, and a lot of times it'll pop back and the bullet will be right there. Um, right. And then another variable I thought about was uh, the pigs we shot weren't that big. So when you think about uh, if you want to poke through a target, if the target is like really locked down, you'll get better penetration. If the target moves with the bullet, then you're going to lose penetration because it's like pushing the target versus penetrating the target. I saw that one time. I was kind of surprised. One of my guys had to shoot a rabid raccoon and I've seen our gold dot nine millimeter shoot completely through 250 pound guys. Uh, and he shot this raccoon, I don't know, 30 pounds, you know, whatever a raccoon is. Uh, and the bullet didn't exit, which I was worried about. Uh, but the, the <laughs> raccoon, definitely took a ride with the bullet you know it, it flopped like two or three feet over to the side and I think momentum loss is what helped capture the bullet inside the raccoon so i think some of these variables are always at play so what you're saying is if you're getting shot at run the opposite direction so yes no, yeah although we know, if you're getting shot at by a raccoon yes I hate when that happens uh, we do know that probably Hopalong Cassidy was onto something in the, in the old Western days when he would throw. So you're getting an extra 100 feet per second out of that uh, cowboy shooting. Nice. Uh, they did that same thing in that Angelina Jolie movie, too. Yes. They, they curved the bullet's trajectory. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So with all this, how effective is a 38 Smith & Wesson out of an Enfield? Because it's just cool. 
what uh what bullet not the not the 38 200 now these uh, are only 145s so uh, oddly enough uh, one of my friends mark freaky is very very into older revolvers and he had a sherman is it a terrier that was yeah. the j frame so the i frame the j frame it was an i frame it was an even smaller gun and we tested several of the 38 Smith and Wessons that he had and the uh, 200 grain round nose and the one, like a 178, it's kind of an off, it's kind of an off uh, weight, but they would penetrate all the way to the end of a 16 inch block and then come, I, I have denim draped over the back because that gives it, otherwise the, the bullet will go flying into the sand and, and you lose it. Whereas uh, the bullet goes through the block, it hits the denim. The denim is kind of a, a little stop catch, you know, it's like a catcher's mitt and we find the bullet. So those traditional 38 Smith and Wesson loads would penetrate fully through the block and just stop. Um, but Mark also had some of the Buffalo bore. It's a mm. hard cast semi wide cutter. And those penetrated completely through two full blocks and ended up stuck in the berm and we couldn't recover them. So, you know, 32 inches of ballistic gelatin penetration with the bullet still traveling down range. So have you talked to him about four, five, five Webley? Because I just might've won a Webley Mark six. Um, I have not, nor have I ever tested those, but uh, we've down at Revolver Roundup when I'm, when I'm there with uh, uh, Wayne, uh, Wayne Dobbs, Daryl Bolke are always there. Um, often Mark Frickley last, last year, Greg Elifritz helped us out. Um, Cecil Birch has been there. Um, Pat Rogers was supposed to help us one time and he passed, uh, right before the event, unfortunately. Um, Claude Warner has, has taught of that. It's, it's a good event. Uh, everything revolver, service revolvers, snub nose revolvers. I always bring ballistic gel and we, we do a demo and then, uh, at the end, people have a, well, I've got a, you know, 38 Smith & Wesson. Let's try that out and see what happens. So I've done gel testing with 22s, 22 Magnums, uh, several of the, the, the 32, like the H&R Mag and the 327s, uh, things like that. Um, Daryl's got a couple of 44 specials. Uh, we've done quite a bit of, uh, just at that event, quite a bit of shooting. That's cool. I can tell you that it, I'm going to guess the 455s were a big bullet and the British were still going with that slower is better and has better stopping power thing. Um, if I remember right, those bullets are lucky to break uh, 500, 600 mm -hmm. feet. So uh, even with a non-expanding projectile, I would expect that penetration is very controlled. And if I had to use one for... Uh, defensive purposes, I would hope I had a full wide cutter or a, a fat and wide nose semi wide cutter. So what you're saying is if I'm running low on Sims, I can just use this. We'll be fine. Well, you know, uh, some of those, some of these rounds that I've chronographed, some of these olden day rounds, yeah. um, like the original Derringers were a 41 rim fire. Remington, yeah. and, uh, those bullets would barely break 500 feet per second. Well, a Sim round is 400 feet per second. Mm -hmm. If that gives you, you know, I mean, yep. there's a difference in bullet mass, but velocity does matter to some extent. Yeah. Well, I was reading, uh, especially with the Webleys, if you're looking at one chambered in 45 ACP, don't be using modern ammo. No, 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 you don't. That that was they ruined a lot of those needle. Yeah. Trying to trying to look for a way to shoot cheap ammo. So you guys want to talk to talk about uh, revolvers more? So here it is. And uh, what was it? Three uh, uh, 327s? Yeah, the, the 327 Federal. That's uh, that's actually something I'm investigating. Um, Cecil stole my idea and he bought one and a couple other people have. Um, uh, Lee has one. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So my idea was uh, have a, a you get an extra shot in a J frame size gun. It's a six shooter versus a five shooter. You can get ammunition that penetrates easily as well as a 38 special but you get less recoil. So you get more bullets that kick less with the same penetration. Um, I've been playing around with that idea uh, as uh, what to carry for my backup gun instead of a 38 snub. Um, Cause you know, we're all truthfully 
always looking for better, smoother, faster, more yep. good, right? Sure. Yep. Um, and, and isn't that, can't you run like five different types of rounds out of there, Chuck, like five true different calibers? I mean, they're the same yeah. caliber, but Pretty different loading. Lesson, which people call the short, which shooting yeah. out of your average, even a snubby is like shooting 22s. Uh, 38 Smith & Wesson long, which is very easy to get a hold of. And again, most of those kick like a 22. Um, and oddly enough, there were people back in the day that, that because of the, the extreme accuracy of the 32 Smith or the 32 longs that, uh, they advocated those as a small caliber hunting pistol because they had a very great effect on, you know, you could get rabbits and squirrels and things like that and kill things as large as coyotes. Um, you got H and R mag, and then you have the 327, uh, federal, the, the 327 Magnum, which is a serious, um, the, the 115, I think it's a 115 grain gold dot. I got to look, but I do recall in ballistic gelatin testing that that 327 gold dot almost equaled the plus P nine millimeter gold dot in effect, um, oh, wow. in, in expansion. So, uh, it, now it's loud. It, it, it's a, it is a loud gun, uh, when you're using those full, full, uh, house rounds but uh mm -hmm. you could load them down pretty easy with a 32 h and r or 32 uh long and and uh, they're very very pleasant to shoot okay chuck would you consider a 351c smith and wesson getting caleb was telling me about that that he carries a 22 mag to me it sounds really cool it sounds like a great option for backup i don't know how comfortable i would be carrying that as my primary well i guess it depends on the circumstances but Sherman, ballistically, how have you been seeing 22 Magnums perform on people's faces? I don't know if I have seen a 22 Magnum. I mean, because they may all have. die. Yeah, <laughs> they could, or or the fact that it's just indistinguishable, yeah. really, from you, you know uh, 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 the recovered projectile from something yeah. else that would be in the same uh, neighborhood. But um, the next time I find one that's suspicious, I'll I'll. Uh, It'd be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I'll see what we can do as far as trying to size that. I, I mean, um, in, in my experience, um, I think 22 Magnums are kind of awesome. I mean, um, the, uh, I love shooting them. Yeah. They, you know, like Chuck was talking about, you know, that 22 long rifles, like hardly ever make the thousand, you know, foot per second threshold, um, 22 Magnums, I don't think they do too tremendously better than that, but I know that they'll most of them will clear a thousand out of a snub nose gun, at least like in the LCR types. Um, but uh, yeah, they um, they're just kind of fun guns. I, I get a kick, you know, out, out of you know small caliber. It's kind of funny. I've sort of gone to the extremes. I like um, really big guns like the forty five seventies and the forty four mags, um, but I also like really really small guns. You know, like. I just got one of my grail guns the other day that I found in the used cabinet that I got with a, a, a gift card that somebody gave me for my birthday. There was a Ruger bear cat. And, um, I've always wanted one of those and I just could never find them cause they're, you know, really popular and people love them. Um, and I found one and I was like, man, this is the coolest little 22, uh, around, you know, and it's just a neat little gun. And, um, but yeah, man, I feel kind of the, the same way you do. Like, I wouldn't be opposed to using either of those as a backup gun or, you know, like a check in the mailbox kind of gun or something. But, you know, as far as like actually hitting the streets um, for, you know, regular life, um, I would be a little bit apprehensive about going that light for me. Yeah. That's seven, seven round capacity. Now you have mm -hmm. a little better capacity. It's easy to shoot. Relatively light recoil. Yeah. That sounds yeah, like fun to me. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't doubt like, you know, if, if, you know, I know that Claude Werner and Caleb, you know, have really like spent a lot of time in that study and I don't, I don't doubt their, um, their, um, you know, choice at all. I mean, I think that if they feel good with it, like I feel good with their choice, you know, I'm not, not going to poo poo anybody else's. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, you know, I haven't, um, I don't own a 22, uh, you know, J frame or LCR size gun at this time, but, um, I do, you know, obviously own a bunch of the 38s and, 
and that's about as, as small as I go. And I, I recently wrote uh, an article on my website um, a couple of weeks ago about the 21st century J frame. And um, it kind of met with mixed reviews because I don't think people, it, it, didn't, it didn't appeal to the, uh, the advertisement crowd because they, you know, they want confirmation bias. I don't yeah. think they get it. Um, is, is the, uh, the uh, what do you call it? The, the end result of the whole article, it's, it's just a SIG 365. Correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's not so much about the equipment. It's about the mission, you know, like, so people you know, go like, well, I carry a J frame because it makes it easy for me to carry, you know, in my sweatpants or carry in my gym shorts or, you know, carry in, um, uh, like, um, business casual, you know, where I have work, where discreetness is the number one priority. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, you could carry like a North American arms, mini revolver in the same capacity, I mean, I, sorry, not, I don't mean capacity in the same mission, yeah. but um, if you can do that same thing with a gun that is as easily uh, hidden, but still allows like very, very good usability, like it does in a SIG P365, like why wouldn't you? Now, I agree that there are some roles where that's not going to necessarily work as well. Like for me, like I'm, I'm a fairly big sized guy. I, I can't make a P365 work for pocket carry. And I'm not really ca crazy about the idea of having a striker fired gun for pocket carry just because all of the holsters for th that I like for um, pocket carry, which are like um, the old Bob Micah's, the Safari lands and the Kramer's um, for the striker fired guns are huge. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a, I'm a big size guy or a good size guy and I can't, fit those in my pocket. So I don't, unless you put it in a cargo pocket, which I don't wear cargo pocket pants, but even then I don't know like how you could quite pull that off and have it be effective, I, but I yeah. mean, but for putting it on an ankle or for a, a discreet appendix carry gun or, and you know, the, the people that carry that are the, the true technicians that carry appendix guns will tell you that the biggest problem with carrying an appendix gun, um, in things that don't have a belt, you know, in light carry or gym carry type situations has nothing to do with um, a lot of the things that people commonly think it has a lot to do with the weight of the gun. So, you know, there's a, there's a real um, red line there between the literal tipping point where the gun's going to fall out of your pants because it's going to make your pants fall down or tear or, you know, pull your pants down just with the sheer weight um, versus what won't, you know, so like a steel frame, J frame will make your pants fall down regardless of, of how, you know, if you don't tie your drawstring tight, it's going to fall down and it's also going to be floppy. Same thing goes with a, you know, even like a, an M and P nine millimeter compact, you know, the old 12 plus one version or, or a Glock 26, same kind of thing. We need to get um, you an enigma. Yeah. I've heard about those. I just haven't gotten in line to, to get one yet. I just, I just haven't, but yeah. Uh, but, um, I would totally use it. Um, but yeah, I, I think, um, that's kind of the, the cutoff, you know, yeah. all of the things considered without, you know, using the enigma, if, if, if you have, you know, if you have, um, an air weight revolver, an air freight, air weight J frame, a steel J frame, and then a SIG P365, if you weigh them all, you know, the steel J frame weighs the most even loaded, um, compared to the SIG P365, but it's the, it's that tipping point, you know, and balance that, that really does it. And, and the, is for me, the P365 does that. And I think that, um, they've gotten the kinks worked out of those as far as the accuracy issues and the sites working loose. And then some of the other things that people were having and to the point where it's now a, a workable solution. And I, you know, when I see guys like Craig, Douglas and Cecil and Paul Sharp, you know, guys that use, um, you know, smaller size guns for discrete carry, but also like extreme sports, <laughs> yeah. if you will. Um, you know, I, I have to like, look at it and go, huh, like this bears some, some reexamination and, and then not also be like such an old fuddy duddy that I'm going to be like, but gosh, darn it. Like, you know, this is the hill I'm going to die on with my J frame revolver and, 
and I'm not ever going to, you know, graduate up to something that's, that's more accessible. I do think that the J frame get, or the LCR gets the nod, um, when it comes to the deep appendix carry stuff, just because the hook shaped grip yeah. makes it easier to snatch it out than that kind of 90 degree or close to 90 degree, like what is it? 72 degrees or something grip that, you know, most semi-automatic pistols have, um, that, that just makes it easier to get out of your waistband, but that's not anything new either. You know, that's like something that goes back to like Chick Gaylord times, like when he was making holsters for men, you know, that wore higher waisted pants than we wear now, you know, when men wore their pants literally right below their navel instead of actually at their hip line. And he made holsters, um, for, um, even up to the large frame, uh, you know, like end frame revolvers that were converted to snub noses, like the three, uh, the uh, model 27s and whatnot that, you know, would fit with just the grip um, being retrievable on a revolver. You know, you, you, you just, as much as people try to sell that idea with semi-automatic pistols, it has to be done very, very, very well for that to work. And, and a lot of people haven't cracked the code. Obviously, Filster's cracked the code with that Dark Star Gear, um, JM, um, yep. and, uh, and Keepers have. But a lot of other people that you see on these Instagram ads and stuff, it's like, oh, that's cute, but you're not. Exactly. You're really overlooking this, this small detail that is actually a, a, like a non-starter, yep. you know, for if, if you actually know what you're doing. Well, you can always carry a 12 pound 2011. Whoa. And in, in a, a uh, an enigma as well with a weapon light. Wow. I think it's, I think it's kind of funny though, that it was a 365. That was the conclusion. Cause it just, it makes sense. It absolutely makes sense. Is that that's the modern J frame. Well, the punchline in there was that the modern is actually the Ruger LCR. Ah. Like, like to be truthful, that's the that's the modern that's the 21st century j frame but the gun that we would use in the capacity of a j frame can be fulfilled in most of those roles by the p365 and now it sounds like i don't know anything about the springfield products because i steer clear of those I do but uh, but i'm a fan of the shield i think chuck is too uh and now they've got some shield that holds you know yep. 10 higher capacity yeah the plus um before long, I'm sure I'll get a hold of one of those too. Yeah. Hey, Chuck, what was your verdict with a 351? Would you carry that as a backup? Uh, I actually had one for a while and I sold it to a buddy of mine that's uh, retired now uh, and has uh, arthritis and recoil issues with recoil. So, a shooter of some stature, Bill Rogers of the world famous Rogers Shooting School. Uh, Claude told me that that uh, the 351 was his backup gun. It's what he carried in his pocket. Uh, super, super lightweight, you know, like 10 ounces, something like that, seven shot. Uh, I can tell you that uh, it's not a Doc Roberts type test, but um, we were making a fire barrel, a new fire barrel at the range. And from uh, 40 yards away, a 22 Magnum gold dot from a snubby will shoot completely through a 55 gallon steel drum and kick up mud on the berm uh, 20 yards downrange. So, uh, you know, what's my gel penetration, things like that. In that particular case, I don't know, but hard target penetration was certainly impressive for such a small gun. Um, uh, the, the 22 Magnum gold dot would be my go, go to. And then like the, the CCI maxi mags, um, in my observation, none of the hollow points really expand well out of a snub, but uh, those bullets do tend to yaw very, very effectively. I would say that a 22 Magnum short barrel would, in wound ballistics wise, would be very analogous to a 22 long rifle out of a rifle, um, in which I've noted every one of those shootings I've attended has been a homicide. Um, so I think the bullets easily has enough penetration, obviously very low recoil. It's easy to shoot those guns. Well, um, personally, I wouldn't lose any sleep over using a 22 Magnum as a uh, backup gun. Now, and we're talking about backups. One quick question, because 
Chuck actually has to go here shortly. Um, what are the criteria for you? Because I learned something, an uh, important lesson from you a few years ago, specifically about ankle carry and weight. So for you, for backup, what are the parameters? So in ankle carry, I want a gun that is less than one pound. Um, and that's loaded. Yes. My left knee is, is wrecked from carrying guns like Glock 26s and stuff like that on my ankle for my entire career. My left knee is just shot. Um, Tom Gibbons came up with the idea of the ankle gun needs to be less than one pound. And he liked things like Colt Cobras, the, the old original Colt Cobra, um, airway J frames, things like that. That's, that's, and I, it's very, very good advice. Tom is a smart guy. Um, I tend to carry a lot of pocket because of the nature of the uniform that I'm wearing at work. So in my humble opinion, nothing excesses from a pocket better than a concealed hammer, like a 642 or a Ruger LCR. Nothing comes out of a pocket better. Uh, if I have my hand in my pocket, my, uh, on the shot timer, my, my first round hits are coming at like 0 0.58, 0 0.6. Um, that's really, really fast, uh, uh, easy to carry, comfortable, things like that. Now, if I was going to do something like some of the guys, uh, like if they're still wearing an under vest and it goes under the shirt, um, and you can strap a gun to the, the vest straps like you would a shoulder holster type draw, I would go with one of the flat semi-autos, like the 365, the uh, Glock 43X, something like that would be my choice. Um, I know a number of guys that are carrying Glock 42s on their vest, and those – you know, there's no weight penalty to speak of. It's almost like the gun is just invisible, but it's there if you need it kind of a thing. I will say that um, what Sherman was talking about with the 21st century J-frame, that's been investigated for some time. Tom Gibbons came up with the idea that the small nine millimeters, like the car PM9, would replace the, the J-frame and brought that up at the snubby summit that was uh, kind of famous in our circles way back in the day. So um, a, a problem is, is a lot of times we don't shoot these guns in the manner that they're carried. I have a friend that's investigated a lot of backup guns and he's tried several of the small nine millimeters and three eighties keeps going back to a snub because what he found is a consistent issue of um, not doing what most people go do when we go to the range most people like you will go to the range unload your carry ammo shoot some ball ammo uh clean your gun reload your carry ammo but so if he took the gun the way it was carried like pull it out of your pocket and shoot it he was noting he was consistently getting the first round would fire and then he would get a stovepipe um, and, and he had that with several of the small nine millimeters and uh, 380s um, and he thinks it was a combination of lube getting a little dry after like if he carried it for two to three weeks um, without without really working the gun. And then, you know, things like pocket lint, dump, dust bunnies, things like that uh, get into the gun when you're in a deep cover mode. So he kept going back to the five shot snub because he if in theory. Some of these other guns are seven, eight, nine shots, uh, you know, easy to easier to reload, things like that. But if they were consistently giving him one round in a stovepipe, when fired in the manner he was carrying them at work, he went back to the snub because he really did get, you know, all five shots if he needed them. That makes sense. A lot of sense. I don't think we test our gear under our operational parameters enough. Mm -mm. Well, that was one of the things that we did uh, the other night at the range. We're breaking out a bunch of pistols. Okay. It's getting dark. Let's use handhelds now. We sure we have weapon lights on them, but let's use handhelds and see what we can do and see how easily also we can identify what we're trying to shoot. Certain flashlights were insufficient. Funny how that works. So I understand you, you have things to do, places to go, people to see. Yeah, I have to, uh, I have to get up very early in the morning. Yeah. I thought oh, firefighters just sleep all day. What do you, yeah. Uh, lately that has not been the case. Um, and you know, we do, people ask me what we do at this job. We do everything, uh, air crash rescue, firefighting. We do the police role. We do a uh, hazmat, uh, in any, anything that happens, we have to handle it. 
Um, we do quite a bit of work back in the county guys in the south part of the county because uh, like every place else, uh, you're undermanned and overworked, you know? Yeah. yeah. So before you take off, Chuck. Okay. What are your final thoughts? Any tidbits of information we may have missed? And where can people find you? Um, there is no such thing as a magic bullet. Stop looking. Um, you know, uh, things that are tried and true are tried and true for a reason. And I think we know where the answer is until we can set phasers on, you know, disintegrate. Uh, we know where the answer is. So we get a need to get our training up to the snuff is what it really comes down to. And then uh, my website's uh, www.agiletactical.com, Agile Training and Consulting. Um, looking at uh, a pretty busy schedule this year. I'm going to be in Utah twice, as an example. Um, so looking forward to that. Uh, we got some good stuff coming up. I'm really looking forward to that. Me too. And our, and our thing in September. Yep. But that's, that's another, that's another thing. Oh yeah. So what was the rough date for your, your visit? Um, that's right around the corner. That's in June. June. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, should be June 11th. Yeah. That's going to be a good time. And, and just, just based on our interaction, the feedback I got and everything from September's event, I am super excited about you coming out. It's going to be a good time. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Okay, Sherman, do you want to keep on going or should we end now? Uh, and we, we can do, a, we can do a, another episode at a later sure. time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So same. Um, final thoughts, anything we missed and where can people find you, especially your Instagram page? Sure. So I think, um, Kind of like following on with what Chuck said, uh, I'd stick to the midline as far as effectiveness for projectile placement, uh, regardless of which plane of the body you're facing. Um, and um, yeah, you know, there's a lot to be said for scientific veracity, which is basically all there is to say. <laughs> if it's not scientific, it can't be held to a scientific yeah. stand. It's it's uh, folly. You know, there's a fine line between where science and philosophy and lies uh, exist. And, and they is not a fine line um, difference between um, science and lies. So you just have to be wary of that kind of thing. But yeah. you can find me on Instagram at Dr. Sherman House. Um, my website is civiliandefender.com and um, I'm, I'll be with Chuck this next weekend at the Range Master Tactical Conference in Dallas. And then uh, my next open enrollment class is in, um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, but it's Dal Dalonega, Georgia. Uh, it's uh, with the complete combatant and Shelly Hill, they're great people. Um, and uh, that's next month on the 17th of April. And I still got a few spots left for that class if people are interested. And um, yeah, and uh, there's all that stuff is on my website. If you sign up for um, notifications on my site, I promise you I don't spam people. And uh, even though it's a blog per se, it's more like a, a website where I write an essay like, once or twice a year. Yeah. <laughs> Not that frequent. And you're also on this primary and secondary forum. Yes, that's right. So that means we could we could have these discussions on a regular basis on the forum and discuss ballistic y things yeah. and sh face shooting things. Sure. That'd be awesome. Well, thanks guys. That was an awesome discussion. And I think we absolutely need to do a sequel and I want to get Pressburg on and I want to get uh, GKR, GKR, yeah, GKR on with us. I think it would be a good time. Uh, big thanks to the sponsors. Big thanks to Filster. Big thanks to Staccato. Big thanks to Walther. Also big thanks to the Patreon subscriber. Go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary. Help support the network. We have this huge, huge, big training thing coming up in September. Sherman, if you're bored, you are welcome to join us. 
uh, September 4th, 5th, 6th. We have a all-star cast of instructors. It's a buffet of training. We have a, I wouldn't say they're an ammo sponsor, but they're going to be able to provide us with ammo at a very reasonable price, pre-COVID and non-rapey pricing. That's, that's right. You heard it here. <laughs> um, and awesome. it's not, yeah. And it's not going to be the, the ammo is not going to be, I'm not going to be able to sell cases at a time. It's basically one case of nine per student and probably a case of five, five, six per student. What you do with cool. it after the class. Yeah. Who knows? Um, all that's on, on primary and secondary.com. Make sure you're using our forum. Make sure you like subscribe, share, Tell your friends, I suspect this is going to be another one of those episodes that people are going to be sharing. They're going to be quoting because there was so much good information. And this is information that people don't necessarily pay attention to because it's, well, it's accurate for one, but it's real. And there's critical thinking and there's science and there's, we're, we're not, we're not catering to bias and what we like and what we think is cool. No, that just results because that's what, that's what we're, we're about here at primary and secondary. So thanks for watching or listening I'm going to cut the feed now so I can edit this and upload it and have it shareable as soon as possible. So thanks for watching. May the force be with you. That's always. right. Um, if I'd have thought of it when we were talking, I would have pointed out when we were talking about Gary Roberts had it said Sherman is also just a dentist.